talking about past and future and excessive emphasis on past and future in your life, it, there's nothing wrong with having a certain intention of what you want to achieve. Take steps towards it. It's it's part of living here in this dimension. You can't just say, I'm never going to plan anything anymore. Just take life as it comes. Well, some people try to do that, but they're not that happy either after a while. Then your life will get very diffused. To have an intention, to, have, to make a plan, perfectly fine. Either a short-term plan, like I'm going to meet you tomorrow at four o'clock. How would you ever meet anybody if we didn't have time? And future in a practical level, of course it's needed. The question is whether future takes over your mind. Being able to use it for practical purposes is of course great, but I call that clock time is fine, but psychological time is when future takes over your mind and your entire thought patterns are geared only towards future and you treat the present moment as either just a means to an end because it enables you to get to the next one. You're always reaching out, so to speak, internally to the next, yet never quite here, always looking for some fulfillment there, but you can never embrace the fullness of now, or you make the now into even an enemy. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because the thing that saved me as an entrepreneur was watching the stories of other successful entrepreneurs, and I learned from their advice, I learned from their motivation, and honestly, I have no idea where I would be if I didn't have those videos to inspire me. I still need them for myself today too, and I hope that they can inspire you as well. So today, let's get some incredible motivation from the one and only Eckhart Tolle. Enjoy. Some people are always unhappy. You, perhaps we all know some, one or two people like that. Three. <laughs> We all, who are, wherever they are, they are they're complaining, it's never quite right. Wherever they are or whoever they are with, after a little while, they're very uncomfortable again. It should be somewhere else. You know the bumper sticker that you see in some cars in you know, various versions of it, it says, I'd rather be golfing. And then another one says, I'd rather be fishing. I'd rather be this, I'd rather be there. When I visited the, the spiritual teacher Ram Das, who lives in Hawaii, uh, he has a bumper sticker on oh, but Ram Das was the person who in the 70s wrote the book Be Here Now. That, and anyway, he has a bumper sticker on his car that says, I'd rather be here now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and, and then you realize you can actually, you can still pursue whatever an intention where you want to get to, a plan, I call that, it's a bit like a journey. Your life is a, is a journey. You're going, you know you want to go from here to there. Whether you're going to get there, we don't know. Maybe on the way you'll branch out to somewhere else. But at least you have a certain direction. It's good to have some direction in your life. But while you are traveling, if the, the, your destination takes up most of your attention and you're continuously focusing on there, you miss all the journey, really. You can't enjoy the journey anymore. And most of your life is the journey. The arriving is relatively rare. The wedding, ah, the, <laughs> and a few more graduation, ah. Uh, but so, so those moments are not the fine few between. So the rest is the journey. And if you can't enjoy the journey, which means the step you're taking at this moment is really the most important thing. Yes, of course, you know you're going that way, but this step is still to be enjoyed because that's ultimately your whole life consists of the step you're taking at this moment. There is never anything else. For many years, before I wrote The Power of Now and it became successful, I was basically a failure <laughs> in the eyes of the world. So he's already almost 50. And what has he achieved? My mom said, you have thrown away your life. You had so many possibilities in your life. You walked out of graduate school in Cambridge. Why did you walk out of there? You... My mom and many other people said, this person has failed in life. He has no job, he has no insurance policies, nothing, no pension plan, just almost nothing in the bank, failure. And then a few years later, people bought The Power of Now and became a bestseller. Oh, a big success. Okay, if I had derived my identity at that time from what the world was telling me, or my mind would have told me if I had been listening to my mind, I would have been very unhappy. And 
I didn't, though. I was fine because my identity wasn't derived from that anymore. And fortunately, even when in the eyes of the world I suddenly became a success, I don't want to derive my identity from that. It's, it's, it's a cheap substitute for who I really am. So I'm not, I don't see, I don't derive, but the satisfaction that comes is the satisfaction that the work that's happening, the teaching that's happening is transforming people's lives. That's very satisfying. I don't get any personal satisfaction though because it's not, I don't feel it as this separate me produced it. It's not that difficult really to step out of the stream of thinking to, um, one way of course is meditation. It's a, the traditional approach is you have certain periods of time, once or twice a day, when you sit down, close your eyes, and instead of involuntarily being drawn into the continuous stream of thinking, you t usually in, with meditation you have a technique or method, you focus your attention on one thing, which could be a mantra that you repeat, it could be your breathing, it's a very ancient meditation, it could be the inner feeling in your body, the uh, sense of aliveness, that pervade, pervades your body. In other words, you take attention away from thinking. And that's already a great realization that you are able, you have a, actually have a choice of directing attention. You don't have to go, to, you don't have to go with your attention all the time where the habitual thought <coughs> patterns want you to go. The, the habitual thought patterns want your attention every time. Every thought says, I matter, Pick, give me your attention, follow me, they go this way. And another negative thought, and another one, and another one. Compassion for yourself, of course, is as important as compassion for others. When you, uh, often I get asked questions like people who did something that they now realize, realize was deeply wrong in the past. Sometimes people ask questions about they brought up their children in a way that they now realize was not very conscious and so that they may have caused suffering to their children or other people find they have caused suffering to loved ones and they now realize that what they did was wrong. And again, I say this is an example where you need to be compassionate with yourself because no human being can act beyond their level of consciousness. So that was your level of consciousness at the time and you could not go beyond that. And again here, to make demands upon yourself, up to a point it might be a good thing to, to if you, as long as you enjoy it, it's a wonderful thing. When the enjoyment of what you're doing is lost, then you have to be careful because there you have to come to a stop and say, okay, there's, there's something here that's not right because I'm no longer enjoying what I'm doing. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. A lot of so-called unhappiness is also a childish way of trying to change things by being as unhappy as you can about them. And the underlying unconscious or semi-conscious assumption is if I'm really unhappy, somebody, perhaps God, is going to do something about it or I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to show him how dreadful it is and then finally, this is an unconscious assumption behind the unhappiness because you believe if you're habitually and frequently unhappy, you believe that it has a purpose. Uh, it's an underlying assumption, perhaps you wouldn't verbalize it in that way, but you believe that it, it's, it works for you. Of course it doesn't, but 
Things are going to change, but just need to be really unhappy so that God finally, even if you don't believe in God, this, this can still be the mechanism, the underlying unconscious assumption behind it. it it's something is going to happen. And of course the opposite is true, because the more unhappy you are with something, the more you are stuck in the situation. How you do what you do is more important than what you do. You could have a, you could have a store uh, serving customers with this or that, which perhaps would not be regarded as a very uh, important job. And yet, if that is done with a quality of presence, where every customer who comes into your store, you, you give this person, your, just an example, your fullest attention, you appreciate him or her as a human being, uh, you see how you can best serve him or her in the present moment, that is quality. And then you would be improving, everybody who comes into contact with you would somehow experience a small lifting in, in their being, in consciousness. And so that you could create a, even a person with a relatively, in a relatively simple job could contribute in that way to creating a better world. I need my story. All the things that my, I, I've been telling myself in my mind about myself and other people and my parents and my relatives and my co-workers and my ex-wife and my ex-husband and what people did to me and on what, or what I did and shouldn't have done, failed to do. Who am I without that? I, I can't let go of that. I need to think about this more. So it becomes a habitual place, the habitual place of the, of the mental noise where you feel, that's me. And so every therapist knows that you always reach a point with your clients, patients, whatever, depending on the school of therapy, depends whatever you call the, your clients, your patients, whatever. There comes a point when you hit that resistance they don't want to be free of their problems. <laughs> and that the big challenge is there, is this person going to overcome that barrier? Because that barrier is not just becoming free of my problems, but also becoming free of a very limited and ultimately fictitious sense of identity, the me. So that is what I've described is the next step, one could say, in the evolution of human consciousness is stepping out of self-talk, which is the conditioned mind and realizing there is much more to who I am than this conditioned content of my mind. And that is the beginning of awakening. It's not, it's not those words, not, not that you need to believe that there is much more to who I am than the self-talk in my head, because that is still self-talk in the head. I believe there's more to who I am. <laughs> and you better believe it too. Analytical thinking itself or processing information is not creative. So to, 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 to even to find a creative, a new solution to a problem in your life requires some creative insight. So whether it's a problem in your work situation or your personal life or something that you need to build or do and you have come to a dead end or you want to create something, whatever it is, a work of art or an, a new system for the computer, I don't know the expressions for that, you need to go to the place where creativity arises and every human who brings who is creative has some access to that even if they don't know it. It seems to me there's a general pattern at work that it is inherent in the nature of physical existence of life forms that challenges 
are an essential ingredient of their lifespan here and part of the way through which they evolve. Mm -hmm. But when they say they evolve, it really means it's the one consciousness evolves, awakens into this dimension through the different life forms in different ways. And it awakens only because we are being challenged. <coughs> and that's already, that is a, quite a relief to realize to be challenged doesn't mean there's something wrong. <laughs> there's something wrong with my life that shouldn't be. If you believe or act as if this shouldn't be happening, then you get really unhappy. Then the challenges become transformed into unhappiness inside you. If it's not unhappiness, it's resentment. If it's not resentment, it's, it's anger. It's self-pity, it's complaining, it's despondency. <laughs> so for the simple reason that you are misunderstanding the very purpose of life and expecting something that your mind has come up with, it should be different. Some people are afraid of not succeeding in whatever they do because they have a self, they, they, their self-image, which is derived from thinking, uh, would suffer. If I fail at something, then I will, my self-image will be injured, and therefore I'm not even going to try. <laughs> and again, that's to do with deriving your identity from thinking. And even the thought, I have failed, is a lie. I am a failure is an even greater lie. You have not failed, you can simply reinterpret and say, I have learned something here, this is not for me, for example. So, but why believe the lies that your mind produces? So, as you know, people, many people live with a very hostile mind. That's. Uh, but those people are, the motivation, their motivation would probably be very great, I would hope, to get out of their minds. But first they need to realize that their problems are self-generated, mind-generated. We may be surprised to know that there are millions, billions of people on the planet who have that same thought pattern, there's something wrong with me. It's part of the human ego. But so you bring in the awareness, and that will change everything. That's the only true key. If you fail, next time you, the anger arises, what happens, you will become aware immediately after the anger has subsided. And then, oh, there it was, and I wasn't present. And then the, the the moment will come when you are there in the first, if you can catch the anger, the first moment it comes, or if you might even see that it could be the result of a thought that creates the anger, and if you can be there in the first moment before it becomes the fully blown anger, then you can stay there, and it might not even become fully blown anger if you catch it the first moment. You can feel the first stirrings of anger. You may only have three seconds. It may come very quickly. Anger is like an explosive energy. You may only have two, three, four, five seconds to, to, to bring the, stay there with your awareness and feel it, oh, it's coming, there it is. That's the pain body, the angry pain body coming. And if you catch it in the early stage, don't suppress it. By catch it, I mean feel it, be there as the witness. Then you can stay, even as it grows, the witness grows with it. It may not even grow. We'll have to see whether it still grows into full-blown anger or not. That doesn't matter. And so you be thankful for your anger because the anger can become a very important spiritual practice for you because through it, awareness can grow. 
So it's, it's uh, sometimes strange for people to see you can be thankful for things that you think are the most difficult obstacles in your life, but they become, they can become the, the greatest opportunity for, for spiritual awakening. Use it as part of your practice. You can, there is a source of power in you that transcends the person. And it's not egoic power over somebody. And it's one with a power that is the power of life in the universe where all life arises. And people sometimes have a problem with uh, self-confidence or valuing yourself. And sometimes you try to convince yourself by changing your thinking that you are actually good enough uh, that you should be self-confident, but there is a better way to, to find the source of self-confidence. On the egoic level, self-confidence is there because you see, you can tell yourself, I'm actually more intelligent than most of these people, <laughs> or I'm better looking than most. I have to remind myself that I'm better looking than most and then, you, okay, yeah, I feel a bit more confident now. <laughs> or you say, I actually have more money than these people, so I should I have more self-confidence. Whatever it is, some way of convincing yourself and then you compare yourself with others and then you focus in on those areas where you feel superior to others and try not to think about other areas where inevitably you are inferior to others because you cannot be superior in all areas. It's a complicated game when you start, <laughs> start comparing yourself to other people. <clears throat> and if you want to bolster your self-confidence and you only have to focus on where you feel I'm actually better than most. But that doesn't really work that well <clears throat> so there is a better way of self-confidence that has nothing to do with comparing yourself with others or with feeling you are better than or not as good as. And that is direct access to inner power. You don't need any comparison. You can have it right now at this very moment if you're not stuck in your thinking mind, but take your attention a little bit beyond the thinking mind and then realize that you are the presence behind the thinking mind without which there could be no thinking. You're the aware presence behind it all that, that is deeper, you've gone deeper than the thinking mind. And that aware presence is where power resides. And it's not yours, because it connects you with universal power. Therefore, you don't need to compare yourself to anybody anymore, or feel, as the ego always does, that you are either superior or inferior to somebody else. That's a not a comfortable way to live where you have to classify yourself when you meet people. <laughs> and so you have the fear is always, I might be inferior. <laughs> or behind that fear is a desire to be superior. <laughs> what happens when you pay attention to the way in which you interact with objects. And what is, okay, it's you, every minute of the day, this, you pick something up, you put something down, you unbutton your shirt, you, or you take off your shoes, you lift this, put this there, open your back, zipper back, <laughs> you look in, inside, take something out, can you feel it? 
as you take it out, can you feel the texture of that? And then you put it on the table. It makes a sound as you put it on the table. And then you have a glass of water and the light is reflected in it and it moves. Perhaps you drink and it tastes and you put it down again. And then you look at a, a familiar object and instead of using it always as a means to an end, here you have the luxury of occasionally just taking an ordinary object that you handle every day and just for a few seconds give it, give it attention and acknowledge its being just as that, as that object. Just feel it, see it, makes, as it makes a noise as you put it down. And again, you bring in sense perceptions, getting dressed in the morning, putting pants on, they make a noise as you put them on a little bit, listen, do things. You pick up the toothpaste, you hold it for a moment, open. Put the cap on the sink, click, and then turn on the tap. And then while you brush your teeth, you turn off the tap because you don't want to waste water. <laughs> But, but that's not part of the exercise, that's an actual thing. <clears throat> and it's, you can actually begin to like and to enjoy the tiniest things around you that would normally be completely overlooked. The, so the way in which you interact with a world of objects and uh, that brings a richness into your life that doesn't depend on how many objects you own. You don't need to own them to interact with them. And so to, here you acknowledge their beingness and you sometimes you might just put your hand, as I'm doing now, here's a table, it's wood, and I'm putting my hand on it and for a moment I feel the smooth texture, surface, of this table, and it it feels very pleasant. And I don't, but I don't need the mind to tell me that. I can I can sense that. And the strange thing is, even so-called inanimate objects, in a strange way, have a life of their own. The true self-esteem comes from not identifying with form. Now, whether we even want to call that self-esteem, I don't know. The true sense of worthiness and of power, true power, comes when you realize the formless in yourself, that dimension, and that all power comes from that. But it's not, it goes far beyond the person that you are. And then you are rooted in the formless, so to speak, or you are it. And that there's enormous sense of worthiness in there, but it's not comparative. It's not more than. You see the same worthiness in everyone, even if they don't know it for themselves yet. So there's power, but not, not more than. There's just, there's just the power of life itself. And you know everybody is an expression of that, although they may not know it yet. Everybody. So this is, you transcend conventional self-esteem. And it doesn't mean you lose your sense of worth. It shifts into something much deeper. If you think the world is full of evil people, you will meet many evil people. And in other words, unconscious people. And even people who are on the brain or who are halfway between conscious and unconscious, when you come together with them, your belief will pull them into unconsciousness. <laughs> <laughs> and that's karma. So karma is the complete absence of conscious presence. And so it's, it's automatic. It plays itself out. And time does not free you of karma. That is a a misperception that if you only have enough time, eventually 
you can become free of karma. Karma renews itself and repeats itself. It's, it's, it's a wheel. And so the only thing that can free you of karma is the arising of presence. And why? how is it that for some person presence arise? I, don't, I cannot tell you why. I only know that at any point in the wheel of karma, presence can come in. It can happen to... This, it can happen to a criminal in prison, condemned to death. It can happen to somebody who has never heard of anything spiritual. It can happen to somebody who has been meditating for 30 years or not happen to some same person who has been meditating for 30 years. <laughs> so in your own life, I can see from what you're saying that presence has already I can sense that presence has already come into your life. And presence frees you from karma, not all at once. Karma has an enormous momentum, meaning the patterns in yourself, the thought patterns, the emotional patterns, the reactive patterns. There's enormous momentum behind that. But as presence arises, gradually karma diminishes in its in the energy behind it diminishes and gradually you experience a, f a fading out of those patterns they become weaker you are no longer completely in the grip of those patterns so as presence arises there's a gradual fading out of karma not that it matters that much anymore because once you are present you can, as we, the a previous questioner said, when we were talking about certain thoughts still arising, certain negative thoughts, that's still part of the karma, the old patterns, the unconscious habit patterns inherited. They still arise, but it's no longer problematic and they no longer cause the suffering that they would have caused before because they are seen in the light of awareness. So the light of awareness arises and in the light of awareness, the patterns no longer dominate your life. They no longer run your life. And if occasionally it happens that the patterns do take over, then after a little while your presence returns and say, ah, well, there it was again. Pain body is part of karma which may be strong in some people, not so strong in others. And so as presence arises, you are freed from karma. It has, and then you have another completely different factor coming into your life. And so, for example, for a person to become free of collective karma, you need a considerable amount of presence for that to come in to remove, and it then will remove you in one way or another, either internally, you find yourself completely free, you might still live in a violent society, but internally you would be free. There is such a, there is a possibility you can have a holy man or woman living surrounded by violence. It's possible, it's rare, but possible. Or very often it happens that life removes you out of there and you find yourself somewhere else. Uh, so let's say vast collective karma, for example, in the case of, let's say, you have the Taliban there, you have uh, all kinds of unconscious movements, you had Soviet communism, you had national socialism in Germany, and for a person being born into that, and not being drawn into that unconsciousness requires considerable presence. So not that many people, for example, in Germany at, when Hitler came to power, not many people were able to remove themselves somewhere. Some artists, some writers, they, they left, they could see what was happening and they, they, they were strong enough not to be identified with the collective when there had been a tradition of obedience to authority for hundreds of years, a tradition of following your leader, and so on. 
to, to take yourself out of that collective karma requires considerable presence, but some people had it. So it is our destiny then to go beyond karma by being the receptacles for presence. All you can do to be helpful in this world and help others is those people that you come into contact with. You may, everybody in this who is awakening will find that sooner or later they, they become a kind of teacher to others. And what a spiritual teacher does, the teacher points out the possibility of awakening out of identification with unconscious patterns, which means the spiritual teacher teaches you to go beyond karma. The usual mistake or dysfunctional way to, of living, unconscious way, is, as I've mentioned before, is devaluing the present moment and overvaluing the next moment. Ego lives always with reference to past and future. The mentally are always somewhere else instead of giving fullest attention to this because this is the most valuable moment. Why? Because it's the only one, the present moment. Give your fullest attention to this moment because it's not true that the next moment is more significant because it never comes. So there is a way of being totally present in the planning for the next, for the future. It's all little things. And even the, whoever, if you are the Pope or the president of a huge corporation or the president of a country, it's still the same. The present moment in its richness that is usually overlooked because you're looking for something more significant. It's not, it's, it's fine to achieve things, especially if they are beneficial, but for humanity and the totality on the planet, it's lovely to have that, but they don't, even that doesn't make up your identity. The more you honor the small things, the more likely it is that you'll experience more good things in the so-called future because you have such a good relationship with the present. Gratitude is an, an underlying uh, state of consciousness which is giving your fullest attention and honoring what is. The, the power to manifest is in experiencing the fullness of the present moment, the undifferentiated fullness. So when you don't complain about not only not other people, but also about your life, then you can't be a victim anymore. I is the light of consciousness in which these feelings are being experienced right now. The victim is a is a huge a huge prison. It's not it is not who you are and remember thanks for everything. I have no complaint whatsoever. So this this wonderful stillness here and let's acknowledge it. The power is not just in you, it's all around you. The transcendence of thinking means the transcendence of the egoic mind. It means that you are able to spend part of your time relatively free of compulsive thinking. Certainly free of self-serving thinking and destructive thinking that continuously creates unhappiness for yourself and the people around you. How many people live in the compulsive narrative in your mind, 
that for many people is very negative, constantly critical, constantly complaining, never at ease with what is. There's always something wrong, fault finding, because the ego grows through the constant opposition, constant antagonism, never at ease, always looking for the next thing to complain about. And it strengthens the egoic self. The, it, it, the more you complain, oh, of, offended is a new version these days, it's very popular on the internet. I'm very, very offended. Outrageous, how dare you? There are thousands or hundreds of thousands who you go on every day, they look on their, their screen waiting for the next scene to be offended by. <laughs> and the ego loves it. And for many of them, it's the only way they can inflate their ego by sit, sit, sitting on the screen and sending out tweets. The transcendent of thinking is not any kind of regressive movement. We are not regressing to the state of somebody who is, whose mind is relatively undeveloped and who does not have a problem with egoic thinking because there's very little going on in their minds. What used to be called, before it became politically incorrect, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> or fool, uh, the fool was, they were always, you could see, happy fools, they, they, they don't, there's not enough thinking to make them un unhappy, so there's, they are below egoic thinking. In the in medieval times, every village had at least one village idiot or fool, and they were, norm was accepted, essential part of the community <clears throat> and even the royal courts had a fool a very important figure although that figure probably was just pretending to be a fool and that was one of the most sometimes very influential position in the royal court but also one of the most dangerous jobs you could have because you could lose your head at any moment. But only the fool was able to tell the king or queen what was wrong no, by making it into a funny story. But the fool is more deeply connected, as we know, know from mythology, the fool is more deeply connected with the source still, hasn't gone as far out as a normally developed human. He's more simple. He, the fool, for example, or relatively speaking, is a simpleton. It's like the hobbit in Lord of the Rings. The, the, hobbit, the hobbit is a simple guy. Uh, doesn't think in complex terms. Loves the simple things of life. Loves eating and enjoyment. But why the fool has to go on this important mission that nobody else can carry out? That's a, a mythological motive, that's often the case, because the fool is, has a connectedness still with source that the more developed humans don't have. <coughs> Similar motive in Forrest Gump, the movie. The fool does great things, this guy, Forrest Gump, he, but he's, uh, because he's, and life always supports him. If you watch that movie again, he always, he, he saves people in the war, he does heroic things, but he doesn't claim credit because he doesn't have much of an ego yet. Uh, and all his life gives him the next thing and the next thing supports him. But we don't want to go there. When I say cessation of thinking, I'm not talking about regressing to the, to the st stage, this is the pre-thinking stage of humanity. I'm thinking about rising above, pointing to the possibility of rising above thinking. 
So you stop thinking, which is normally associated with the diminishment of consciousness, and transcendence of thinking is an intensification of consciousness, turning up the light. This is why the term attention and alertness, those terms are extremely important. They're also used in Zen very frequently. Uh, the Zen teachings could be described, if you wanted to summarize Zen, uh, it would just, you can just say simple things like pay attention. There was one Zen teacher who would, whenever they asked him a question to explain Zen, he was, became quite famous. He, he would always raise his finger, please explain Zen to us. What is Zen? I haven't quite understood yet. <laughs> he was calling people to attention. Now, this attention, there's a state of attention that sometimes people experience when they are engaged in dangerous activity. You can climb a mountain. Do you think you're, do you think you're doing much thinking when you're hanging on this wall? No, you can't. You have to be absolutely present. In that moment, you have transcended thinking and the situation has forced you, is forcing you into complete presence, this highest degree of alertness. Without it, you slip and you're gone. And so, this high degree of alertness, however, has no has no tension in it. In this, in the case of somebody practicing dangerous sport, yes, there is physical tension, but the the state itself has no tension in it, and you do not need to engage in a dangerous activity in order to <laughs> enter that state. We are entering it here, because even as I talk about it, I hope, well, I don't really hope anything, but I, I trust that as I speak about it, you, simultaneously to listening to it, you can verify in yourself this state of attention, which is a state of very high alertness, but there's no tension in it. It's not the alertness that sometimes goes with fear, and you go, but it's not, uh -huh. that's really a contraction of the entire body. It's, it's not really alertness. It's, oh, oh, so that's not it. It's a, very, it's a relaxed alertness. There's both yin and yang in it, coming together, and it's it's that. If you, I, I just also mentioned the other day, when you first look at something for the first few seconds, a new vista, a new landscape, you enter a room, or you step out of a room into the open, or whatever it is, or suddenly something new comes into your field of into your perceptual field, in the first two or three seconds, you're, you don't know what it is, you have to first take it in. There's a moment of alert presence in this, but usually you're only aware of the sense perception, you're not aware of the background of the alert presence itself. But you can be aware of the alert presence itself as you take it in, and that's the key. So you're not just alertly present, you're aware of the field of alert presence in yourself, so to speak, as yourself. And the awareness of it and it are the same thing. Cessation of thinking. Now, you can try it, let's even now, I would suggest that as I'm speaking, you may find, you may not know this yet, in the moments when I'm not speaking, like now, and now, and now, if you're alert, you're not thinking, you're just present. 
and now there's just an alert field of presence. So some of you may not be able yet to be totally free of thinking, but I believe that most people are able to well, they have short gaps of no thought, pure awareness, or no thought, just a short. And then you look around. In that moment, your whole, your personal sense of self has receded. In a mom moment of pure presence, which is just this, you, do, you have no memories and you have no expectations for future you have, because you have no thought. But you're not, you haven't fallen asleep, you're, you're very awake. In that moment, you're not a person anymore. What are you? Just a field of consciousness, conscious presence. Something has emerged from within you and has taken place of the person. The person is still there, it's just gone receded. If the only thing you achieve in life is this, that you are able to become, be free of compulsive and addictive thinking, if you're able to, to, almost one could say, to choose not to think when there's nothing in particular to think about, when you can just be present. So in other words, if you can step out of thinking into aware presence, that alert space, then that is the greatest thing you could achieve in this lifetime, that any human could achieve in this lifetime. And yet there's nobody left to say, I have achieved it, that's the problem for the ego. The ego would love to say, oh, I have achieved the state of, of presence. <laughs> so it's not an achievement. I'm just saying it's an achievement, but it's not really. Uh, <clears throat> because you didn't do it. You got out of the way and then it happened. You know that you get defensive. The question is, do you know in the moment of getting defensive that you're defensive or do you know it afterwards? You can look into that. I'm rarely content or grateful. That's interesting. That's very good self-observation too. I'm not content at this moment. I'm not content. My thinking is so negative. Another good piece of knowledge. My thinking is negative at this moment. What, what are the thoughts that are going through my head? So if you apply the awareness that is already there hiding behind all these things, if you apply the awareness to the present moment when these things arise, defensiveness, what is low self-esteem? It's something that you tell yourself about yourself in your mind a certain repetitive thoughts that the voice in the head tells you those are this is self low self esteem you there might be certain emotions that go with it emotions that are, oh, oh, oh. but really low basis for low self esteem is something you tell yourself about your low worth it's thoughts now, the questioner already knows that she has low self-esteem and if she can know that she has low self-esteem in the moment of the low self-esteem arising as thoughts, she can recognize them as thoughts and not necessarily true thoughts arising, repetitive thoughts that condition thoughts. Perhaps the road self-esteem might have started in childhood. It often happens to people whose parents are very critical or parents tell them you're never good enough. It, this can be one reason. So it might have started there. It's a conditioned way of thinking, conditioned thoughts. 
Now, the awareness that's already there in the questioner would need to be there in the moment of those things arising. And then you can see when these thoughts arise, you recognize them as thoughts that are arising and you're no longer completely trapped in what these thoughts are saying. In other words, to use an analogy that we used not long ago, you can, your sense of being is not in the thought anymore, it's in the awareness of the thought. In other words, if you look at the sky, the vast sky, daytime, this time, let's look at a daytime sky, the vast, the vastness of that, the huge expansiveness of the sky is awareness in this analogy, and clouds that come are thoughts. So when the clouds come, why can I never do anything right? Why, why are other people more successful than me? Or I'm no good at this. When these thoughts come, instead of being drawn into those clouds, and then the clouds get bigger and bigger, you remain the sky and allow the clouds to pass and then to pass away. And that means you begin to no longer, you're no longer feeding conditioned thinking and you are separating who you are. You're taking your identity out of thinking. Thinking for a while has still a momentum. Old patterns will come again and again, but you're no longer renewing them. You're no longer feeding them by, how do you feed them? By identifying with every thought that comes. There's a self in it. It's in, so you separate yourself. You are the awareness behind the thought. Same applies to any kind of negative thinking. You recognize it as automatic. It arises and it's a thought. So, but you are the awareness that knows that this is a negative thought pattern. And if that can grow, because it's already there to some extent, if that grows, which means deepens, then those condition patterns will diminish, they get transmuted. <coughs> so, another one point here mentioned, I get defensive easily. Uh, defensive can happen, happens very, very quickly in, in human interactions. The defensiveness can come up so quickly, it's an automatic pattern. And you may only know it afterwards, oh, that was defensiveness again. Uh, and defensiveness is, an, of course, these are all ego, ways of the ego to protect itself, ego being the mind-made self. Defensiveness will, will just come up with any, any lie just to keep its ego identity uh, intact. So it will come up with anything uh, just to keep, it's automatic. So, you can, of course, in Miracles has a nice, lovely saying, which is, uh, whenever you become defensive about anything, know that you have identified with an illusion. You have identified yourself with an illusion. That's interesting. Is that true? Let's say you say that the distance from here to the moon is 300, uh, I think in, in kilometers it's like 350,000 or so kilometers, and that the light takes just over one second to travel from the moon to the earth, and you know that for a fact, well I know that, I haven't verified it myself, but it seems to be true, and somebody else says, no, that's completely untrue. It actually takes one minute. It does. Now, this is just a difference of opinion, of viewpoint, and of course, you know very well that the other person is wrong. Now, if you, if you say, no, that's not right, is that defensiveness? Well, it depends how you say it. The question is, are you identified with your mind, which has this position, which happens to be true, but are you identified with that mental position? In other words, is it, do you derive your sense of self from thought? 
if you identified with, you will get angry and defensive about the other person who is so completely wrong. And you might say things like, well, if you know that person well, you always doubt me. Why do you always doubt me? You never believe what I say, do you? That's called defensiveness, and that's the ego trying to protect itself. And then the course in miracle thing applies. Know that when you become defensive about anything, know that you've identified with yourself with an illusion. The illusion is not that it takes one second for the light from the moon to travel to the earth. That's not what the illusion is. The illusion is that you identified with a thought, with a mind pattern, and so you are strengthening an illusory identity <laughs> by identifying, by strengthening the mental position of me, my mental position that's unconscious. So this is how just a difference of opinion can degenerate into huge conflict, just a small difference of opinion, because the ego becomes defensive. So that requires alertness on your part, so that you know when it arises. Oh, So whenever you become defensive, so without ego, the same conversation would go, no, it takes one minute, I know that for a fact, the other person says, it takes one second, it takes a minute. Uh, well, no, you're wrong. It takes one second. Okay. Well, we leave it at that then. I think it's a second and you think it's a minute. End of the story. That would be without, without defensiveness or ego. Okay. And then you can go on, on of where everybody goes on the internet. <laughs> And that would definitely solve it. <laughs> and in extreme forms of egoic unconsciousness, you will say, what it says in Wikipedia is wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. They didn't get it right. <laughs> <clears throat> that may bring me to another question. Oh, just to, to end on this question. The key is your awareness, so that that deepens, then all those patterns that you mention will weaken. Uh, and there's already a considerable amount of awareness in this person, the questioner. The awareness, of course, isn't the person, but it's deeper than the person. The thing is to apply the awareness to the present moment when things arise not in some abstract way, I am a defensive person. Will I ever become a person who is not negative? Will I, I can't get rid of my negative patterns. I, I'm so negative. So it doesn't matter. Let, this moment is what matters. So just apply your awareness to this moment. You can't change things into mental constructs. How can I change myself? I don't want to be that kind of a person anymore. Look at it. <laughs> to this moment. This is where you, you apply presence. I say sometimes call it, I haven't used that expression in a while, the sword of presence that cuts through time and you go, Psh, and then you apply it to this. So you need to realize most humans have this inbuilt dysfunction. They cannot acknowledge the present moment. Unconsciously, they regard the next moment, whether it's a minute from now, or an hour from now, or two years from now, always regard it as more important. Whenever you are impatient, trying to get somewhere, waiting for something impatiently, what's the next thing I have to do, and now I have to do that, and you're pulled in all kinds of directions, what's now, oh, now I have to do that, and that, and that. And there's always a pull to the what's the next thing, uh, that is, I call that sometimes, you lose yourself in doing. Doing is necessary, obviously, you need to do, but to lose yourself in continuous doing is a serious dysfunction, but it's so normal that nobody realizes it. 
So what, if you lose yourself in the doing, there's always another, th and this is how stress arises. What's, stress is the gap, in the gap between now and later, the projected then, now and then, in that gap arises, the stress arises. So the mental projection towards future creates the stresses between you, where I'm here, but I want to be there. <laughs> and for many humans, that is their predominant state. They are always, they are here, but they, don't, they really want to be there, either there in space or time. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing, and, and even you, awakening beings, may still, sometimes or often, find yourself in that state where you'd suddenly realize that the whole day you've been stressed about this, that, and that, and that. This the world makes so many demands upon you. You need to deal with this and this and this. Amplified by the gadgets that we now use, this is an amplification of the dysfunction through this. Uh, and you lose yourself in the doing. You become completely un- centered and, and basically lost. There are many, even, it happens even to children already at an early age these days. And many children are suffering from attention deficit disorder and so on, which means their, their, their mind is being pulled always away from the present moment. So lost in doing, lost in doing really comes back to lost in thinking. Thinking underlies doing. So you are lost in your thoughts about the world. And then you engage in all kinds of activities propelled by thoughts that I now I need to do this, now I need to do that. So the basic condition still for most humans on the planet so, fundamentally, yes, they are lost in doing, they lose themselves into, but basically it means they are lost in their mind, in the movement of thought. What now, you identify then, they identify with every thought that arises, and the th many thoughts are about future or the past. Not that many thoughts are about the present moment. And if they are about the present moment, then it is an interpretation of the present moment that is completely determined and colored by your past conditioning. So, very interesting to observe in oneself this tendency to deny, devalue, disregard, reduce the present moment to a means to an end. It's always a means to an end, but it's never rec recognized for what it is in itself. And often it is, not, it is more than a means to an end. For many humans, this is a very dysfunctional way of being, for many humans the present moment is actually regarded unconsciously as an obstacle that they need to get beyond. There's con a continuous underlying unease. And what's the next thing that's, that's going to go, go wrong? I know it's going to happen. Lost, lost in the mind, lost in thought. There was an Indian teacher who described the essential human condition as lost in thought, and of course, that's how it is. You, this is then, this movement of thought gives you your sense of identity, then, then the, the unease, the, the, the uneasy narrative, the problematic narrative of me and my life. I have to think about this when I wake up in the middle of the night and I carry this heavy burden of my problematic life. For many humans, their identity 
is unconsciously regarded as a problem to be solved. I am a problem that I'm looking for a solution to this problem <laughs> that I am. <laughs> and of course, then you go to a therapist. No, if the therapist is good, he might be able to take you beyond that. Depends. If he or she is not good, then you get more deeply entrenched and 15 years later you are still undergoing psychoanalysis and find ever deeper layers of complexity in your past. And there's no end to it. So, the present moment is devalued, not recognized, regarded either as a means to an end or an obstacle. That is, the, for many humans, that is their predominant state of mental emotional state. And the, as I said, the identity is derived from that. So it's the, the, the error lies in identification with thought. Now, the question arises, who or what is it that identifies with thought? If I am not the story that I tell myself about who I am, if I am not ultimately that, then who or what am I? And what is it in me that that identifies with the story? What is it that creates this sense of identity that is mostly, exists mostly in a state of unease or very often discontent because it, it cannot acknowledge the present moment. That is the ego, by the way, that's what we call it, the, the egoic sense of self. There's a very simple spiritual practice to get you to the realization of who or what it is that identifies. I suggest at this moment that observe yourself internally right now to see if there's any lingering emotion in you, perhaps from earlier today or an hour ago or yesterday or the past two years or the past ten years. Is there any, and can you feel, uh, for example, any, is there an irritation somewhere? Is there some kind of uh, anxiety? Is there kind of uh, uh, heaviness, a certain heavy mood, a despondent mood, perhaps? Is it lingering there? Is there anger, anger, big thing, some residue of anger from what happened earlier? Is that in you? And then normally humans would say, I am angry. Or they would say, I am anxious, I'm fearful, I am in a bad mood. Now, there's already a delusion when the moment you say, I am angry, or I am anxious, that indicates already that you have identified with the emotion of anger or the emotion of sadness or the emotion of fear, you have identified, you equate I with what arises in your field of consciousness. So you say, I'm angry. It would be more correct to say, there is anger in me right now. Now, it may sound a trivial difference be between saying, I am angry and there's anger in me, but it, it, there's a significant difference which goes beyond mere syntax, how you put words together. Because when you say I am, you equate I with whatever condition is there in you. This applies to emotion and it also applies to thought. When 
because anger is often it's not just the anger as emotion, the anger also exists as angry thoughts, and then they, they, inf they reinforce each other as a vicious circle. When you, when, they, when you are trapped in irritation or anger, the emotion feeds the thought, and the thought feeds more energy to the emotion. It's a vicious circle and you don't want to get out of it. You might notice when you observe an angry person or, or a despondent person or an anxious person, they don't really want to be free of the anger. They don't want their... <laughs> if you suggest it to an angry person, you can be free, you will not get a, a pleasant answer. And you, you've seen angry people who, they are in the grip of anger or irritation, they cannot help it, then they shout at you and then they leave the room and a minute later the door opens, they come back because they sort of something else to insult you with. <laughs> they, they, they are in the grip of it, there is co complete identification with thought and emotion. They are lost. <laughs> In thought, they are lost in emotion. But who or what is it that is lost? <laughs> if I'm not the thoughts and the emotion, who or what am I? Okay, I just asked you to just have a look inside yourself and see what it is, if there's anything there that's jarring and doesn't feel good, but it's there. And I'm not saying try to get rid of it, no. Acknowledge the present moment. The present moment is what is, externally or internally. That's what is. But there's a huge difference now. You've already, by recognizing that there is, let's say, irritation, anger or anxiety in you, an additional element or dimension has come in. And that dimension we could call awareness or we could call it presence. And the moment awareness comes in, you are no longer completely identified with it. One could say, I sometimes describe it as, let's say, there's the anger, and as your awareness of the anger comes in, there's a little bit of space around it. That's the awareness. The awareness knows that there's anger. The anger may still be there. It may not immediately disappear, but the awareness knows it's there. Or whatever else it may be, the arising of awareness is spiritual awakening. The disidentification that happens when awareness arises, that is the spiritual awakening or the arising of the transcendent dimension of consciousness. Transcendent because it transcends who or what you are as a person. There's no need to demand that external conditions should be perfect so that you can become still. In fact, it's sometimes the case that it's precisely when external conditions are seemingly unhelpful, that can sometimes be a great opportunity to find that true stillness. And especially that is the case when external circumstances have the appearance of actually being a hindrance something disturbing, something happening that upsets the status quo in your life. And those are great opportunities because then your motivation for going deeper as you suffer when things happen in your external life that, quote, unquote, should not be happening then you begin to suffer, and as you suffer, the motivation eventually arises of going deeper, 
of finding the place where there is no suffering. And you could still suffer a little bit on the external level of your life. So sooner or later we find in our life that life does things to us, seemingly putting obstacles in our path, seemingly having bad intentions towards us, <laughs> we experience diminishment in some form. Of course, the ego says, or the egoic self says, that's terrible. I don't want any diminishment. Diminishment meaning loss of something that had become part of your sense of self. It could be loss of possessions, could be loss of a relationship, loss of a loved one, loss of a healthy body, diminishment of physical health, loss of your persona of what other people think of you. One day they tell you that you're the greatest and the next day they tell you you're awful. Diminishment of whatever kind is abhorrent to the egoic self. <laughs> There's a beautiful saying, I believe it comes originally, I'm not sure, but it doesn't matter where it comes, it comes out of consciousness, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but I believe it comes originally out of Sufism, And that is, when the ego weeps for what it has lost, the spirit rejoices for what it has found. And those people who, and there's no human, by the way, who does not experience this in life several times, Sooner or later, the next one comes. Some people experience it even very early in life. Some children have experienced loss of a parent, of both parents. So diminishment comes sooner or later. How do you meet it? Recognize it when it comes, not as a monster or the work of some malevolent deity or demon that wants to sabotage your life, but as an opportunity also. Now, you may not be able to be grateful for it in the moment of it happening, that would be perhaps, perhaps too much to ask. But you will find that at, at later, a year may pass, two years depending on what it is, suddenly realize that it has taken you deeper into the essence of who you are because something was removed from you that you thought you were, but it was a fiction ultimately. You had identified with something that ultimately is not who you are, it's a temporary thing. Possessions, not status, great physically strong body, good looks. A relationship. And then it retrospectively, 
very often you are able to be grateful for the loss, for the diminishment, because it drove you deeper. It brought out the essence of who you are beyond any form. Now, it does not do that to all humans. It's for everybody. Diminishment is only a potential deepening. The, the possibility is there. And many, many humans are not able to use it because nobody has told them. The knowledge, this kind of spiritual knowledge, is still very limited. It is not part of mainstream culture. People are dying every day without having any true assistance. People who are approaching death, who are getting old, the our mainstream culture still knows nothing. It's just, let's prolong life as for as long as possible, even if it's totally pointless and it creates a lot of suffering. Let's just, because we don't know what to do with death. That's one of the reasons why the, the foundation will hopefully be able to reach people to use the opportunity of this greatest diminishment, which is death, the greatest, when as you approach death, an enormous opportunity for spiritual awakening and realization. But many humans, of course, miss the opportunity of that diminishment and with the result that the ego becomes even more hardened through it, or in the words of Brother David, shriveled, shriveled up to an even harder, lifeless thing. <laughs> then either you carry continuous anger or resentment or despondency for years, which becomes part of your egoic identity. And the ego loves any kind of identity. If it's a miserable one, doesn't matter, I'll have it. <laughs> Just give me a strong identity. I take miserable any time over being nobody. <laughs> so the opportunity of diminishment is missed. Often you see when people, they're wealthy people and suddenly something happens, they lose their money and then they jump out of the window because the entire sense of self was associated with their possessions. There are people who lose their reputation. You remember, of course, the case of Mr. Madoff, he is a few years ago, who had this uh, scheme, fraudulent scheme, and people lost millions or billions of people who were investing with him on Wall Street. Uh, they lost, it was a pyramid, it was a Ponzi scheme, I think is the word. So he was deceiving all these people and they lost all their money and he had accumulated billions and then finally it all collapsed. Now he's in prison and his sons couldn't take it. Uh, one, one of his sons, apparently the sons didn't know what was going on, I don't know if that's true, but they were also working in his firm in his company, I think, believe one died of cancer soon after and the other committed suicide. Would have been a great opportunity if only somebody had told them, you've lost your money, you've lost your reputation, this is a great opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Find yourself, the opening is there. But it's just lack of information, nobody told them. I hadn't actually thought of this until this moment because we had, want to bring the, the teaching to places where it otherwise uh, would not be go or would not reach. And I just thought of Wall Street. <laughs> We will donate books and CDs to boss. 
So we'll have to call Goldman Sachs tomorrow. <laughs> see if they agree. <laughs> now, they won't be very interested, perhaps, at the moment, but they may become interested in the future. <laughs> uh, just wait. <laughs> So you have already, I believe, everybody here has already experienced some forms of diminishment, to use that word, through the physical form, the psychological me entity, and for many, the reason why you're here is because you've gone through that, and it has deepened you. Even the collapse of a relationship, you don't even have, don't have to be married, but you have a relationship, it doesn't go well, it ends, it's a little death, it can be painful, it leaves a little uh, hole in you, it, takes, it seemingly rips something out of you, and for quite a while you feel it, it's not pleasant, but that too is an opportunity. So when the ego weeps for what it has lost, oh dear, terrible, so terrible, I'll tell you what happened. And I'll tell myself what happened. Even if nobody's listening, it'll go off in your mind. Oh my God. I can't take any more of this. I just can't take it. It's just too much. What's the point of it all? Just completely. It's good to act out the, the ego sometimes because then you can actually see it. It's like a reflection in the mirror because it's funny because you remember everybody knows, familiar with that in some way, and that's why it becomes funny. I've, I'm learning from Marianne yesterday because she has other ways of acting out the ego. It's a little bit more feminine, but I can try that too. <laughs> <laughs> it may look a little weird when I do it, though. <laughs> but it's, there's a lot in it that doesn't really need to be explained in words. Just this simple gesture implies a self-image, to look at yourself through a self-image. Look at me. <laughs> Be grateful for whatever your experience of this moment is. And if you cannot be grateful, at least allow it to be, because it already is. You might as well. Now, if you did this little thing, it sounds very little, and it is very little, allowing your experience of this moment to be the way it is. Just this little thing would remove, oh, well, it's hard to put it in percentage terms, let's say 95% of the suffering from your life. I don't know about the rest, the 5%, we'll get to that sometime. That would already remove a gigantic chunk of unhappiness uh, in whatever form, <clears throat> unhappiness is the most generic term one could use, the Buddha called it suffering. <clears throat> and so for the next six months, then uh, that obviously is one of the practices, uh, not to internally resist, 
your experience of this moment. Now, of course, many times, possibly you forget that, and that's fine. The moment you realize that you forgot it, it's there again, and then you can accept the experience of this moment as the unhappiness that is arising in you because you forgot to accept your experience of this moment, and so you feel this unhappiness arising in you, and you say, where does that come from? Oh, I forgot to accept my experience of this moment. And then you accept the unhappiness, and the weird thing with unhappiness is, when you completely accept the unhappiness, it cannot survive very long. <laughs> It doesn't like, it cannot actually coexist with acceptance. <laughs> so the weird thing then arises that you say something like, okay, I'm unhappy, that's okay, I don't mind being unhappy. And then the unhappiness goes, what's going on? <laughs> that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> The, uh, cannot, the unhappiness cannot survive for very long with the acceptance, even the acceptance of unhappiness, not indulging in unhappiness, but the acceptance. Now, the acceptance of unhappiness, it presupposes that there's an awareness there that knows that you're unhappy. Now, that might so sound like something <laughs> very natural, but it isn't, because the most unhappy people, and there are still millions, and of course they have reasons for being unhappy, yes. The, and it's not necessarily the people who you'd think would have the, the most powerful reasons for being unhappy. It's often those who you would think, well, they, they, there are many millions who have it worse than they, but these are more unhappy than those, it's often the case. So the unhappiness is something that when it's recognized as unhappiness and accepted, something happens to it, it begins to dissolve. But the really unhappy people are so identified with the unhappiness, which is a combination of certain recurring thoughts in your head, a certain narrative that is not pleasant, whether it is about my life, whether the narrative says my life or oh, dreadful thing, my life. Oh, why did it all go so wrong, so wrong, wrong? And now I have to, that's it, it's nothing I can do. I'm, this, I'm, or, or whether the narrative is about somebody else. Do you know what he did, what she said and did, and what she, and the, my, the narrative may be about something that hasn't happened yet, and it goes on and on. Or something that happened in the distant past, or not so distant past, there, so there's a narrative. And then there are emotions that are a reflection of the narrative. The narrative is thoughts, certain types of thoughts, certain thoughts that have a certain frequency. And, and then that awakens the emotional frequency because the body thinks the narrative in your mind is reality, that is the reality that you're experiencing. So you, the body reacts with an emotion. Simple, ex simple example at night, you can't sleep because you're extremely worried about what's going to happen to you or somebody close to you or even the world. And it all sounds very critical. There's a crisis in your head. Not outside, outside your head, there's a pillow, 
and there's a, a blanket or, or even something big and fluffy and soft uh, down duvet and there's no unhappiness there and if you look around the bedroom also where's the unhappiness it, the plant is okay it's not unhappy no it's all happening in here and then the body since that is your, the critical reality that you inhabit. You are, there is a crisis in your life. The body doesn't know the difference between what's actually happening and what's happening in your head. What's happening in your head is taken to be the, the absolute reality. And then you experience the emotion that goes with those, that kind of narrative. And so there's no awareness. And when you're trapped in that, you don't even really know that you're unhappy because you are the unhappiness. The unhappiness has become your identity. So when you become the unhappiness, you don't even know that you're, or suffer, let's use the Buddhist term, suffering. When you are in this deep suffering, you don't even know you're suffering because the suffering is a gigantic, huge chunk part of your sense of self. You are a suffering entity. And as all therapists know that once the patient or the client or whatever they call the people that come to them according to their school, the, uh, they reach a point where there's a possibility of going beyond the deep-seated patterns, unconscious patterns, and then there's a huge resistance very often because the person is afraid of losing a very important uh, piece of their identity and sometimes it's the most important part of their identity. If they have lived with an unhappy sense of self for years and perhaps even decades, they don't want to let go and again they don't know that consciously, they, they never say, I do not want to let go. But if they could say that, then they, that means there's already some awareness. So, lack of awareness, lack of presence, that is the unawakened state that still, unfortunately, millions of humans are trapped in that. But the moment you know, you recognize your inner state, that, that means there is an awareness, which is, is a di there is another dimension of consciousness that has emerged in you, through you. A deeper dimension of consciousness that is not the conditioned thinking. So we can call it awareness, we can call it presence, we can call it the unconditioned consciousness. And then the beginning of freedom, or right, the possibility of freedom arises. And it's from there that you recognize your inner states as they arise. From there that you recognize your unhappiness, you can say, oh, you can, like, you can feel the unhappiness. But the moment you become aware of suffering or unhappiness in you, you're no longer feeding it with your thoughts. As long as you're not aware, you're feeding it as a vicious circle, you're feeding it with your thoughts, with your narrative, and you're trapped in the vicious circle. Your narrative creates more unhappiness, the unhappiness creates more thought. And you're trapped in that. So for the next six months and, and hopefully beyond, because it's a much more pleasant way to live, uh, you make it your practice to be aware of your inner states and meaning. No matter what situation arises in your life, whether it's little things, big things, difficult situations, difficult people, challenges, problems, because the next six months are not going to be free of challenges and problems. So whatever it is, realize that the primary factor in any situation is your inner state, because that determines how you respond. So no matter what it is, your primary responsibility is 
to be aware of what goes on inside you. And that means whatever arises in your life is actually to be used in your practice so that you do not uh, become dependent on what's going on externally in your life. So your inner state gradually is no longer determined, perhaps still a little bit, yes, but not completely determined by outer events, people, situations, and so on. Inner freedom arises, that's awakening. How you, how you respond, and that, if you are, I have the, we can use the two words, react, respond. The way I use them is, react means, it's a karmically determined reaction. The, you, 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 you act, you react out of the conditioning of your mental emotional field. Response implies that you are present and your action is no longer determined by the mental emotional the conditioning of the person. There is a higher intelligence, one could say, or I, I, call, I call it wisdom, but in other words, there's a higher intelligence that can then operate in your daily life. A higher intelligence, which we could call wisdom. So it's not the conventional intelligence that you can measure in IQ tests. <clears throat> That's a very limited version of intelligence. There's a higher intelligence that comes in through presence that deals more intelligently with any situation that arises in your life. That's, that's the only possible way of dealing intelligently is by um, dealing with the situation through presence. Especially important, of course, in human relationships. Because there's so much unconsciousness that happens in the interaction between human beings, between two human beings and larger numbers of human beings and then groups of your collectives of your millions of human beings here and another million there and there. Or this, you can see when you look at politics and affairs and so what's happening in the world, there's very little intelligence, the way they deal with things. And you would be, you are amazed. How can they be so short-sighted and ultimately have to use a simple word, stupid. <laughs> uh, but these people have degrees, they have university degrees. How can they be so stupid? Well, they only activated a, a, a very, very limited version of intelligence that you can measure in IQ tests, that's not enough. You, you, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody who has a very high IQ, <laughs> uh, or is a member of this, there's an organization called Mensa, I believe, so if you have a very IQ, you can be a member of that, and that's good for your identity, of course. <laughs> so I don't want to take anything away from you, but, the, there is, that is not real intelligence. It's a, yes, it, it's a form of intelligence, but it's a r relatively low form of intelligence. A much higher intelligence comes in through presence, and that is lacking in the world. There are, occasionally you see, very rarely you see a politician, actually you can see, oh, this person has some real intelligence and insights. And it's usually not the people who are running things. It's, if, if it's a politician, it's usually somebody who's been pushed to the periphery of politics, uh, and from there he or she comments on uh, the, un the stupidity of what's happening in, uh, in the world. Uh, I've observed it, it's um, in different countries, a similar phenomenon, 
there are okay, there are a few people here and there who ha you can see clearly where we are going and what we are doing. It is crazy because there is a lack of true this higher intelligence that is beyond the egoic mind. And um, well, at the moment it doesn't look good because we are going. When, uh, uh, I was going to use that weird expression about the hand basket again. <laughs> so you can see it. Now it's important when you look at the state of the world. Um, it's important that you don't. You do not enter a reactive mode because that will draw you into unconsciousness. If you also, if you watch too much television or current affairs, you will be drawn into most likely unconsciousness, unless you watch it as an, uh, um, you watch it as an anthropological study of how misguided humanity can be. Uh, <clears throat> so you need to stay present while you look at all this and see what's happening. Question may arise, shouldn't I be doing something to, well, there may be something you can do bring some sanity into this world, perhaps through saying something, speaking out, pointing out something, not, cre not creating enemies. If you see people are, do uh, are deluded in what they say or do, to, don't make them into enemies and attack them and say, you are totally crazy. No, it's the, it may be that the what they what they do maybe and probably is dysfunctional and stupid or the the opinions they hold may be extremely misguided and irrational so you can you can address the opinions that they hold their mental positions and point out the rationality and so on without making the people who hold their opinion into enemies. So don't equate the mental positions that people hold with who they essentially are. You can speak out, maybe you can post something on one of the many platforms that are available, something that is sane rather than insane. But it may, Perhaps you can post something that points out the insanity of it all. Some people do that, so that's a good thing. Now, because some people may suddenly say, oh yes, that's true. So higher intelligence comes in and that can then deal with situations, and that's the end of karma. What humanity is doing now collectively is uh, karma playing itself out, the movement of unconsciousness. And so, as we mentioned yesterday with reference to individuals, we, you remember we talked about responsibility. Can you, can you hold a person responsible for what they do if they are unconscious? We talked about that yesterday. If they are in the grip of their, their mental emotional conditioning, that is part of that's their karma. Can you hold a karmic formation person can you hold a karmic formation responsible for what they do? <laughs> Not really. So there's a deep wisdom in what Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness means the realization that 
they are not responsible, they can, I cannot do otherwise. But we also, and this also applies to the collective, what all the, the politicians are doing and so on. <clears throat> They don't. They don't. Don't know any better. They are in the grip of egoic reactivity and short-sightedness that comes with it, and so on. But as as is the case with individuals, although they may not be and are not cannot be held responsible, and yet they have to suffer the consequences of their unconscious. This is how humans ultimately awaken. They are not responsible, but they still have to, they create suffering for themselves and others. And through the suffering that created through the by the unconsciousness, an awakening happens. So in other words, the ego uh, is necessary for the awakening to happen. The ego ultimately self-destructs. It has built into it a self-destruct function. <laughs> the, that is ultimate wisdom. Uh, uh, so that also applies to the collective. Um, already, if you look at the 20th century, the wars that happened and the internal conflicts in countries that happened, so, the countless millions upon millions killed by other humans, what they did, the terrible suffering. This is all the movement of unconsciousness. They, they, can't, they don't know what they do. And then they suffer, humanity suffers and suffers and suffers. Through the suffering, gradually, an awakening happens. So the, the, the ego's dysfunction creates suffering and ultimately, the suffering acts as an awakener. <laughs> it's just a question of how much longer is the suffering going to go? And what's the next stage, you may ask, in the, on the scale of collective suffering? I don't know, but it doesn't look good at the moment. <laughs> but you are here to represent to embody the higher intelligence. I mean, hopefully you don't make that into a mental concept. I embody the higher intelligence. <laughs> it is true, but it should not become a mental concept that you identify with. <laughs> and so the sanity, you, you embody the sanity in a world that is still predominantly, one has to say, insane in many ways. Not all of it is insane, but a lot of it, some important parts are insane. So let's then see what the, whatever comes is, uh, may be bad from, from a, a, the, a, the lower perspective doesn't look good, but ultimately everything that happens is in the service of the evolution of consciousness, even in your own life. And if it's, it applies in your own life, it also applies to the collective of humanity. Adversity can either, it can strengthen the ego, or it can gradually, or in some cases suddenly, dissolve the ego, or at least diminish it. So it can go either way. And I must agree with you, I don't know whether you literally said it, in perhaps still in the majority of cases, it strengthens the ego, because nobody knows, people don't know the opportunity that every adversity represents. So why does it happen? How does it strengthen the ego? You can see it sometimes with people who are sick or people who are disabled. Let's say I've met disabled people, people with physical disabilities, for example. And in some cases, they are very, very really angry with the world and bitter because look at what happened to me, they say 
why do I can't move anymore? I've been afflicted with this. What have I done to deserve this? And these are oh, questions that are the, the justifiable questions. The uh, the question what uh, what have I done to deserve? Why has the world or whatever they say, God, the world, the universe, or whoever they've done this to me? Why? And then they become bitter and angry and the ego becomes more and more rigid and hardened and and, uh, and so that is one way it could go and then I have met people with disabilities who through their disability at some point whether through a spiritual teaching and in some cases never come into contact with any spiritual teaching it just happened that at some moment, they realized intuitively that all the suffering was generated through resistance. And then the resistance to the isness of their life, this moment, they were able to let go because perhaps the suffering was getting too much. Something happened, something clicked inside. Or even if it didn't happen completely, uh, they were able to have moments of uh, inner peace. An inner peace that is not caused by an external condition. An inner peace that seems to be in contra contra contradiction to an external condition. So that they would say, how could a person who is suffering this feel so peaceful and so um, also that applies to people who are um, approaching the end of their lifespan because they have some illness and they have been to the doctor and the doctor says you have six months or one year and so, and suddenly something in them opens up and all that remains is that the person already dies, there's no more future, and all that remains is the present moment and the, the aware space. So I've had to, the privilege of working with, when I was still seeing individuals, with uh, two or three people to whom that happened, and they became luminous beings in the last few weeks or months of their lives, and became just... <laughs> There was no, there wasn't, I couldn't see that there was any person left. There was only a space of conscious presence left. Just wonderful, as, as if they had just come into this world. So they came, and then they came to me, and then still asking questions, very profound questions, wanting to understand what happened, and it's beautiful. So this can happen. It can happen collectively to people who have, who go through warfare and in countries or become refugees, they lose everything. And again, it can go either way. Uh, whenever there's any great loss in your life, that again, an opportunity opens up. If, if you resist and you, re you resist, uh, the resistance origin, the origin of the resistance is a narrative that forms in your mind. Uh, that says something about the situation and about your life and about other people. Uh, so the narrative forms in your mind and the narrative is an unhappy one. And then there's continuous resistance and non-alignment with the isness of the present moment. Now, one could ask, well, how could somebody who has lost, who's lost their home, perhaps even lost love, loved ones, and then they, they don't know where to go. How could this person be in a state of alignment with the pros, present moment? Isn't that how can how can somebody accept the unacceptable, accept that which in conventional terms would be regarded as unacceptable? How is that how is it possible? But that's precisely it. If you can accept the unacceptable, that is the sudden the opening and then you realize the unacceptable 
is actually not unacceptable. It is acceptable. <laughs> and the I was homeless for a certain period in my life with not knowing where to, what to live on the ne next day or the next week. And uh, uh, I had already gone into the state of acceptance, so it was a very pleasant experience, but potentially would have been extremely unpleasant. So not having a home was for me already something that was not experienced as something bad. But I knew I had to take some action eventually to uh, to get a home. And so gradually something happened. I don't want to talk too much about that. I also mentioned in the, the New Earth, I believe, um, there, when I was at university, there was the... Stephen Hawkins, the physicist who was confined to a wheelchair, passed away a few, couple of years ago. And there it was. Um, he, he would always, he wasn't famous at that time, only famous locally in the university. We would always be in the same dining room uh, having lunch, but not the same table. I never met him, wasn't introduced, but, uh, observed him many times sitting at a neighboring table. And, I, and then I, the one moment when I hold, held open the door for him, he was coming through in his wheelchair and I looked into his eyes and I could see there was no unhappiness in this world. You have to be careful with what kind of thoughts you absorb from the collective because there's so much unhappiness in the collective energy field of humanity. So it's very easy to get drawn into that if you're not careful and participate in the suffering of the collective fear, anxiety, anger that's everywhere. It's also very easy to be affected by certain thoughts that can take over your mind that come from the collective thoughts and thought patterns. Anybody who is not sufficiently present, sufficiently aware, is susceptible to uh, being infected by certain thoughts. The mind Certain thoughts become lodged in your mind. Every thought is an energy formation, like you could say a little entity. A thought gets lodged in your mind and attracts associated thoughts and becomes a bundle of thoughts. And without awareness, so you identify with the thoughts and then you are in being possessed by certain thoughts. They may be, they may arise from your personal, but very commonly they arise from the collective. In your personal life, you could develop some kind of thought that of an obsessive nature that occupies your mind and. Uh, you can't get rid of it. Um, it could be the thought of one directed to one particular person, very, very negative thoughts, um, even at the simplest level. Some people have 
words. You can have a melody that you can't get rid of in your mind. You can have a whole day or two days and you can't get rid of some this thing that's in your mind. It repeats itself again and again. You can have certain assumptions about this world, like they may be totally absurd and irrational, or there may be some truth to it, but only there may be an aspect of the truth. Uh, you might think that um, the most absurd thoughts could be there. You might think that the uh, the extraterrestrials are already here. Well, they may be, but uh, and every other human is actually an alien, and you just have to look at them carefully to figure out whether they are aliens or humans, and uh, that could. I'm not excluding the possibility that some aliens may be here, but we are really, I'm talking about obsessive thoughts that are probably not correct. Uh, and then it colors your subsequent perception of reality gets totally colored by the obsessive thoughts and it, it can explain everything in those terms or the evils of the world have suddenly one explanation um, another one that's also in the collective, you can have a thought that the, the entire world is divided into oppressor and oppressed. Uh, you, any human being either belongs to the oppressors or to the oppressed. That was an idea in communism in economic terms, in terms of social power. They divided humanity into oppressors and oppressed. And then they look at, you can look at any human being and to me, he's oppressed, he's an oppressor. <laughs> now, thing is, of course, oppressors and oppressed have existed and to some extent in, in some areas still exist. But to take one, one, fragment of truths, because the totality of human life is much vaster than that. This is one aspect. But if you take one aspect that then occupies your mind because of lack of awareness, you are possessed by a thought. And this thought says the entire world, this is just one example, it could give many examples. The entire world is either, either uh, the essential identity of any, any human being is either they are oppressed or they are the oppressor. Now, of course, if that is the, what, the thoughts that dominate your mind, then obviously you would probably regard the oppressed as the good ones and the oppressors as the bad ones. So that, uh, then that simplifies life <laughs> enormously. You immediately can decide who is good and who is bad. And you are probably good, presumably. Um, even if you, if you are an oppressor, traditionally, you're, you're, you, you now uh, um, recognize your sins, and you will atone for your sins of being an oppressor and you side with the oppressed and therefore you become one of the good people. <clears throat> okay, so we had the same phenomenon in very extreme form. We all know about Soviet communism, we know about Chinese Mao Zedong Cultural Revolution, quite a crazy time period. We know National Socialism in Germany, all these the evils perpetrated by all these collective delusional systems that divided people into good and bad, entire groups gave them an identity. Um, I was in Cambodia a few years ago and visited the um, the the death camps of where Cam Cambodians are, it's a small country so not many people are familiar with the recent history of Cambodia but they had a 
a, an extreme communist regime under a mad dictator called Pol Pot. And in that risk, extreme communist regime, and Cambodia uh, experienced a dreadful suffering. One third of the population was um, killed by, by their own government because they were the oppressors. An oppressor was anybody who could read and write because the, obviously they were exploiting the peasants. Anybody who wear, wore glasses, he could would immediately like that's right oppressor. They would be sent from the cities into the countryside to work on the fields where they didn't have enough food, and most of them starved. Uh, total lack of humanity. Total lack be, because of the entire country was dominated by one absurd and obsessive thought that that made them uh, made it impossible for them to relate to any human being as a human being. They relate to him through the conceptualization that they, that thought had created for them. They couldn't sense the humanity, the being of the other human anymore, the moment they had imposed a conceptual identity on them. This is an extreme example of what can happen to you when you're taken over by certain thoughts in your mind. This is not to mean that of course, oppressors and oppressive existed and exist, but it's not, not the entire explanation. There are many other facts in this life. But I'm saying all this because you need to be very alert so that your mind is not taken over by certain thoughts that are not, um, that invade your mind and color your view of reality. And uh, there, are, there are certain irrational thoughts that are floating around in the collective at the present time. So it's very easy to, for you to absorb some of them and being possessed by certain thoughts and maybe it's so irrational that it's unbelievable, but um, I'm not giving any examples, but you have to find it out for yourself with awareness you can. Uh, and be be very careful with observing your mind. Be there as a witness of your mind so that you don't get taken over by, by certain thoughts, that your mind does not get taken over by certain thoughts. And then uh, you, you, you cannot perceive reality anymore as it is. You, everything is colored by the veil of irrational thinking. So when you, nowadays, these things can spread very quickly and easily, these irrational things. In the past, they were confined to either one country or one area in a particular country. Uh, but nowadays, certainly rational thoughts can go through the entire world through the technology we have and can quickly affect millions of humans all over the world. So in the past, you had it, as I said, limited, let's say the, uh, the, um, the hunt for witches in the past, are totally absurd and irrational. It's a mental disease that uh, affected certain countries or areas in certain countries. And this mental disease then, uh, so uh, there were some places in, in Europe, there were villages and towns in Europe in the Middle Ages, during that time of collective insanity, there, there were almost no women left in, in some villages in towns at that time. Because they were all been burnt or, or drowned because they were called as witches. Absolute, absolute insanity. So don't underestimate how insane humans can become. Uh, <clears throat> the only um, antidote uh, that you have against that is awareness, so that your mind does not get affected by mental virus. The awareness, the awareness is aware of what your mind is doing, so that your mind does not get occupied by one particular way of thinking, which is probably irrational. Anything that's one-sided, that does not see the 
uh, totality of a situation, like oppressor and oppressed, uh, if you don't see the, the, the many factors that uh, make up a human being's identity, uh, so very be very careful with what you consume in the media, uh, the, the, the media that br brings the news to you, be very careful with what you consume so that you take, do not take on, without knowing it unquestioningly, certain ways of looking at the world, uh, realize that you're being uh, how manipulative most of the mainstream media has become. You need to watch that if you watch it knowing how you are being manipulated and they, they, the people themselves are being manipulated too. So it's, they are in the grip of unconsciousness and they want to draw others into unconsciousness. Uh, so they're not, they're not the evil ones. They just don't know any better. You are now, compared to years ago, you, were now, you are now definitely more conscious than you were before. And it could be that in the past, when you were not conscious, you did things that you know, now recognize as not right, or you inflicted suffering on another being or other beings, and you can now see it. At the time, you didn't know what you were doing because you were not conscious enough to, to act differently. Now, the fact that a person feels guilty means he or she can see something now that he or she could not see then. If you were still in the same consciousness, then you wouldn't be able to see that that was wrong and say, you, you did the right thing by whatever, killing that person, I did the right thing. But now you see, you have awakened and then you can see a lot of your past as dysfunctional, unconscious action, inflicting suffering on yourself and others. Virtually every unconscious human inflicts suffering both on themselves without knowing it and others. They create their own misery and they make others miserable. That's what unconscious humans do. And some to a greater degree than others. So guilt can come up as you awaken and suddenly see how unconscious you were, that can bring up guilt and say, because the guilt says, I did that. The guilt says, uses the word I. But what does that mean? What does it mean when you say I? What is that I? Who is I? Is I the conditioning of your mental emotional conditioning? Or does I have a deeper meaning? Is who is I? When you think that your mental emotional conditioning is I, th then you are deluded. Your mental emotional conditioning is not I, it is the mental emotional conditioning in you. It is a false identity. There is no real I there. The only true I is the I am. It is you, uh, you, the, the essence of who you are is consciousness. That is the I. I am that I am. That's even the, how God describes himself when in this is probably the, one of the most profoundest lines in the Bible. Somebody asked God, who are you? Or what's your name? I am that I am. Because your deepest I am is the I am of the universe. It's not personal. Your deepest identity is the identity of God and of the, of the universe. This is the I am. That's the only true I. So when you confuse the unconsciousness of your past, which was only conditioning, which was a reflection of where humanity is at, at its present evolutionary stage, you reflected where humanity is 
in its present evolutionary stage. That's all. You were a reflection of the evolving, but or the unevolved, as yet unevolved human consciousness. That's all. There is no I in there. It's not that I did that. The unconsciousness, the human unconsciousness did that. If you construct an I out of human unconsciousness that you represented, that is an ego attempt to manufacture another mind-made identity for yourself because the ego loves to have a conceptual identity. The ego is conceptual identity in the head. That's me. I. So, and the ego doesn't mind even if it's a very unhappy conceptual identity. It prefers that to having no conceptual identity because that's its end. So the ego will cling to the guilt and, and associate unconscious action in the past with identity, my identity. And that's how, how the ego can survive for years and you can torture, it can torture you for years uh, saying, I did that. And it's a terrible feeling that, that you did, that you can now see it as so wrong, that was so wrong. But it's ultimately a delusion. Find the true I, and then that will free you of that. And then you will naturally forgive yourself without needing to take an action and say, I must forgive myself. That doesn't really work. In the same way that it does, this can also be applied to other humans. You can also do that to other humans what you do to yourself when you see what they did and you can manufacture an identity out of their unconscious action also and then say this is who they are this is who he is who she is it's not it's unconsciousness playing itself out human unconsciousness there is no ultimate identity there but, but the mind likes to manufacture a conceptual identity not only for yourself but also for others. So the mind loves to get in there and these are those evil ones and sometimes you do it to a whole group of people. Those millions of, this particular group of people no matter what they are, they are. This is what they are and this is what they did and this, that is who they are. No, it's human unconsciousness, that's all. So, very careful, the same process, and then you cannot forgive them because you've made an identity for them out of their unconsciousness and say that they are their unconsciousness. <laughs> and then forgiveness will be very hard. Okay, I have to try to forgive because I'm supposed to do that. I have to forgive them for what they did, they did such terrible things, but I have to forgive them. Okay, I forgive you. Ah, uh, it's not easy. Yes. <laughs> the real forgiveness happens when it just you realize that ultimately there's nothing to forgive. And that's true forgiveness. There's nothing to forgive. And forgiveness happens naturally in this way, not, not as a conscious thing that you do, but a thing that happens by itself. It falls away. The, the false identity that you inflicted on yourself or, or, or another human being or a group of human beings, that false conceptual identity falls away. And that is an essential part of being here as a conscious human being. A conscious human being does not have resentments anymore because what could you resent? It's only if you manufacture pseudo-identity, then there's resentment. So all those things just, they fall away. And there's the, the flowering of consciousness. You need the challenge and you need to challenge yourself. In, if you want to create something, if you want to bring about some change in this world, you want to make your life, your so-called life better, you are looking to achieve this or to learn this or to acquire this. That's part of being human. We don't deny that. And if you don't want to achieve anything, let's say you have no ambition whatsoever, you say, oh, it's all pointless. 
because you don't want to be you don't want to challenge yourself then life will challenge you even more if you don't if you challenging yourself would be even to engage in physical activity and jogging you're challenging yourself or you're lifting weights for you're challenging the body on a physical level the only way you can make the body stronger the physical body is by making let's put I'll put it like this is a strange way of putting it but it's true you have to make life difficult for your body otherwise it doesn't get stronger well to lift a weight is I mean if you ask the body would you rather have a good just relax or lift this weight <laughs> <laughs> oh no I just want to relax it's not, I don't want to have make my, don't make my life more difficult than it needs to be so I just okay it, you don't get stronger without the but when you, you make life difficult for the body then more energy is demanded and more energy comes flowing in the energy doesn't come until you demand it there's a request or a demand for energy because there's a there's a gap between uh, what you want and what at the moment the body doesn't have enough energy and suddenly it comes and then you reach a point when an influx of energy starts then you it's no longer perceived that the the life uh, you make life difficult for your body once the energy starts flowing the body enjoys this flow of energy but before the energy starts flowing life was difficult for the body and so you always you meet always the the threshold of life gets difficult for the body and then energy comes in and then suddenly not even perceived as difficult anymore and that you may experience it every day when you start exercising when i look at you first thing i would see is your personality and of course the physical body and the personality whatever makes up your personality but if i look more deeply and not just look but actually sense your presence i know that beyond your personality there's an essence in you that is one with the essence in me and one could describe it as consciousness itself the essence of who you are the essence of who I am is consciousness. When I recognize that consciousness, the same consciousness that in me, this consciousness beyond the conditioned self, recognizes the consciousness in you, that which is beyond your conditioned self. And that recognition is what Jesus called love. And therefore he said, love thy neighbor as thyself. But that as a separate statement, it doesn't work. But when you put it together with kingdom of heaven, that, then it reads, find the kingdom of heaven within you, the dimension of spaciousness. Then you will recognize your neighbor, which is anybody that you are with, then you will recognize him or her as yourself. And this recognition that in essence you are one, that you are deeply deeply connected that you share the the one consciousness when you recognize them in the other then you have suddenly an outflow of benevolence and goodwill and love not the ego love but true love towards the which in the old testament in the new testament is agape spiritual love for another human being you can sense their very beingness so and that's the whole secret of the of of all spirituality, it's in, Jesus, in the teaching of Jesus. I haven't gone through physical death yet, uh, as the, the Zen master who was asked about life after death said, I don't know. And they said, why don't you know? You're the master. And he said, yeah, but I'm not a dead master. <laughs> <laughs> But I've gone very deeply to what one could call death to identification with form. So in a way I have gone into that realm from where I can say and know that ultimately what we see as death is the dissolution of form. That the eternal in us, which I know that firsthand, cannot be touched by that. So, 
What exactly happens, I would say, depends on whatever state of consciousness you were in. That was a predominant state of consciousness in this lifetime. If in this lifetime you were continuously identified with form, your body, or the psychological form of me, that means consciousness, this expression of consciousness, was still in a somewhat dreamlike state, which is identification with form. And you can easily extrapolate from that if the tendency of consciousness to identify with form was still there, which in other ways the awakening had not happened, this tendency will continue, there will be further identification with form and the process will continue as the consciousness that is not yet fully awake will continue to identify with form again and then gradually come to a place where awakening happens. Or if there has already been a disidentification from form in this lifetime, then you can extrapolate from there that the compulsive urge to identify with form and to seek another form or another cycle of form identification, this compulsion to seek further experiences through identifying with form then would either be much weaker or be completely absent, in which case the consciousness that you are is no longer bound to this realm and will not seek to re-experience the realm of form. But in either case, you really, I know, I can tell you that all is well. It does not really matter whether this person now needs further experiences of identification, in which case this will happen, or whether he is already free of this urge, in which case he will move on and live in a realm that we can't even conceive of from where we are here. I get a sense deep within in the forms of what that is but we don't need to talk about it here. All we know is nothing, this is the beginning of A Course in Miracles, which is the entire Course in Miracles summarized in two lines. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. That which is real in him is beyond form. Anybody can know that when you see a dead body, you realize that this is no longer whom you knew. This is not the, this is not the being that you knew. This is only a shell. So nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal ultimately exists. This is why sages from all traditions speak of this realm of form is ultimately illusory. It ultimately, it depends what level you look at. The important thing is, all is well. Beyond the appearance on the level of form, which is the only level where death exists, it is the transition from, from one form into another form or from one form into formlessness. That is what death is, no more than that. Nothing real dies. Nothing real dies. Which is to say, ultimately, there is no such thing as death. There only seems to be. It's a transmutation of form. Either form dissolves or seeks some other form, some other identification with form. Jesus often talks about the kingdom of heaven. Interesting expression. And I, there's a line which I opened the Bible the other day and I saw the line it said, Jesus went from village to village and from town to town and said, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the, the whole thing is already contained there. 
Repent means, it's, mis, it's a mistranslation, repentance, the original Greek is metanoia, which means a turnaround, a mm -hmm. shift, a complete shift. So the repentance... What so people the, think of it as apologize or something like that. Yes, that's or, actually or not beat yourself is. up, I'm such yeah. a miserable sinner. That's not, that's a misinterpretation. The misinterpretation of repentance started when it was translated into Latin, uh, into Latin as penitentia, which was already wrong. <laughs> and mm. now we have metanoia as repentance. No, a complete reverse, a complete turnaround. In other words, a shift in consciousness. Repent. Now, what does he mean by the kingdom of heaven? Now, Christians traditionally believed it's something that's going to come. That's the belief they completely overlooked when they asked Jesus, when, when does the kingdom of heaven come? He said, the kingdom of heaven does not come with observation. In another translation it says, the kingdom of heaven does not come with signs to be perceived. You cannot say it's over here mm -hmm. or it's over there, for the kingdom of heaven is within you. Now, what is that thing that's within you where you can never say it's there or it's there? I, I retranslate kingdom of he heaven into modern terminology. For kingdom, I would substitute dimension. And heaven, what is heaven? When you look up into heaven, you see the vast sky, the spaciousness of the sky. He used that analogy to point to an inner reality. He used, because language usually refers to external things that you can see and touch. So the closest that Jesus could find in the external world to point to something in the inner realm was to look at the vast spaciousness of the sky, which in itself has no particular form, but is amazing. And he said, the kingdom of heaven then is, heaven, my translation is spaciousness, mm -hmm. inner spaciousness, which is the uncluttered mind, consciousness without conceptual, without thought, inner alert stillness the dimension of spaciousness. Find that dimension, of that's the primordial teaching in Jesus, find that within yourself. Find the kingdom of heaven, find the dimension of inner spaciousness, where you're able to be alert and still, completely conscious, but not thinking. And that's the essence of Jesus' teaching. Have the main focus of your attention in your daily life in the present moment. The rest of your attention, so that's the, the main focus, here's this. The rest of your attention is where you want to go to, your, whatever task you're engaged in has a certain purpose. The purpose is you want to finish the task and it has achieved its purpose. And that's here. And that's in, the, in your peripheral, the peripheral vision of your consciousness. That's where you want to get to. And this is what you're doing in order to get there. And your main attention is not where you want to get. And in the meantime, you're just doing it in order to get there. You can see how that already creates an inner stress. I'm here, but I want to be there. That's the normal way of living is this, the main part of people's attention is there, but in the meantime, they are here, where they don't really want to be. They'd rather be there, as shown in famous stickers on bumper stickers on cars which say something like I'd rather be fishing <laughs> when I visited Ram Das the spiritual teacher who is now passed away he lived on Maui uh, <clears throat> on his car I saw a bumper sticker which said I'd rather be here now our purpose here, beyond the personal purposes that we have, everybody has their personal purpose, the work you do, whatever it is, 
there's a deeper purpose that the personal purpose must be aligned with. And that deeper purpose is to live from that deeper place. Uh, the way I interpret, you know, in the English language doesn't have a word that describes both man and woman. It's the German language has mensch, mm -hmm. which is also used in Yiddish, mm -hmm. which is the German word. It has mensch means both man or woman. For a long time I regretted that the English language doesn't have a word for mm. human. You have to say human being. But now I'm happy that I have to say human being because that describes exactly the two dimensions. The human is a conditioned self. It's a personality, your historical person, which comes from the past, based on past, who you are as a person. That includes your physical body and your psychological self. I call that sometimes your form identity. There's a physical form and there's a psychological form of you. That's the human. And then there's the being. The being is the deeper self that is consciousness, unconditioned. And no human life is fulfilled unless the human has at least some access to this dimension within them. That really is the ultimate purpose to at least, maybe not complete access, but at least to have glimpses of that which transcends the self, to have glimpses of self-transcendence in your life. If you, you, no matter how successful you are in this world, if you have never had even a glimpse of self-transcendence, then your life is pretty purposeless and, and it's very unlikely that you will be a, a happy human being. Is, is the ultimate paradox with all of this that it's almost impossible to hold on to? So even someone that has spent their life uh, trying to attain that state, uh, that you can't, A, you can't, you, to function it as a human, maybe not as a human being, but just yeah. as a human, uh, it would be almost impossible to constantly be in yes. that state, in yes. a world that doesn't exist in that state. Yes, uh, not constantly, but it is possible to, f uh, to, to not just have that when you are perhaps, let's say, engaged in spiritual practice or you're meditating or when you're out in nature and some happy moments out in nature. It, it is our task to, as much as possible, incorporate that deeper level of consciousness into our daily life. Even if we don't succeed all the time, uh, that's fine. That's part of the practice. So one could say then, our purpose in our daily life beyond the personal purpose, which is also important because we need to honor who we are as a person too. And we need to honor our identity as a person because no doubtedly that exists. And whatever it is that makes up your identity, whether it's mostly of personal kind, whether you identify with a certain a collective around you, it could be your religion, it could, whatever it might be, uh, or the culture that you grow up in, that has its place. That, that's nothing wrong with it. But if that is all you know about yourself, mm -hmm. that's very limiting. So you honor it, but there's more to you than that. And that's why the ancient Greeks said, starting from Pythagoras, uh, 500 BC, know thyself. The most, perhaps the most important dictum in ancient Greek philosophy, which was carved, carved on the walls of the temple of Apollo at Delphi, know thyself. Very deep saying, know who, who you are in your essence. So because you have the form identity, which is a personality, the form, and you has an, have, as I call it, an essence identity. And so to know yourself as this essence is it called in, in, in Indian, some in some Indian, Indian spiritual philosophy is called self-realization. I am is the word. All you can say is I am, but you don't need to, you don't add anything. Not this or that. I am. In the Old Testament, God is asked, "Who are you?" And that's perhaps the most profound sentence in the Old Testament is, I am that I am, where God defines him, her, itself 
as the I am, as the essence identity of all forms. And also the another beautiful sentence in the Old Testament, as you know, the Old Testament is a mixed, the New Testament, the Bible is a mixed bag of fantastic things and other things. The, <laughs> but I like to look for the jewels that are there. Another beautiful statement that points to all this is, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Now these words are all synonymous. Be refers to being. Still is the state of consciousness without thought, stillness. Being and stillness, the same thing. And know, there is a deep knowing in that, in fact, it's, that is because that is the source of all intelligence. There's a deep knowing, but from the point of view of the conceptual mind, it looks like unknowing. It looks like ignorance, because it's not knowing through concepts anymore. It's, there's a deeper knowing, and this is where what we call wisdom arises, which is very different from intelligence, the IQ kind of intelligence. The wisdom that the world needs, not more intelligence, please, no, <laughs> but wisdom, the, yes, n be still and know that I am, it is the I am, of the, the I am of being, God, Oh, here we come to a difficult word, but they're all synonymous. What is God then? I rarely talk about God because you can't really, it's so transcendent that whatever you say would be very limited. As you know, human language and human thought is relatively limited. How can I make statements about the ultimate transcendent reality just by producing a few weird sounds with my vocal cords plus uh, air pressure through my tongue and lips. Oh, the vowels, A, I, A, E, I, O, U, E, U, R. This is what language is. Oh, you, you, you. Okay, now tell me the ultimate secrets of God in the transcendent universe. You can't, it's absurd. Just produce a few sounds and that explains, no. However, I'll carry on talking. All we can do is give a, an analogy or like a poetic image of what God might be and how God relates to who you are. And that image is I, that I prefer is the image of, in, of our, you know, we can only use images from our sense-perceived universe. Uh, if the sun is a life-giving thing in our universe. The sun gives of itself ceaselessly for millions and millions of years. One could almost say eternally. It's not eternal, but as far as we are concerned, it's eternal. Without the sun, there would be no life, no physical life here. So the sun gives of itself, it emanates continuously. Uh, the very heat in your body ultimately comes from the sun. So the sun, if you use the sun as an analogy for, for the the transcendent, the transcendent God, God has no location in space or time. God is neither there, or if we have to say anything, we could say God is right here, because it's transcendent to this dimension. So if we use this as an analogy, the, the transcendent emanates into this dimension something that creates form, that creates life. 
And what it ultimately, this thing that it emanates is consciousness. At first, very little. At first, consciousness appears as, as if it were frozen, as minerals and stones. And then consciousness becomes as if it were a liquid, if we use the analogy of water, then it becomes vegetative life. Then, and consciousness gradually evolves. So one consciousness morph, it comes in. And then you get animal life. It's, it's like, and then you get human life, it becomes ethereal. It's a human mind. So emanating from the source of all life that is transcendent, of which you cannot say anything, into this world, as the sun emanates light, the God emanates consciousness, and this brings about this universe. And in this universe, it's a process, it grows. In the transcendent, we don't know anything about that. So, now the important thing is, the ray of sunlight that you come, that hits your hand, you feel the warmth on your hand, uh, that ray, it's not the sun, you couldn't say, I have the sun on my hand. I mean, if you got close to the sun, you would immediately disappear. But this ray of sunlight is still connected to the sun in some way. It is still part of the sun. We can't even say where the sun exactly ends. It doesn't really end anywhere. It doesn't have a clearly defined surface. It extends outward, so it emanates continuously. So what the, what the source of all life emanates is consciousness. And you can sense that in yourself. When you can sense yourself as consciousness, the presence, then you, are, then you realize this, the ripple on the surface of the ocean has realized that it is not only a ripple, I'm mixing analogies now, it's not only a ripple, more fundamentally the ripple is the ocean. And suddenly the ripple is no, 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 longer, no longer fearful because it can sense its deep connectedness to that which is vast and all-encompassing. And so the ripple suddenly lives in a different way because it realizes its own timeless essence. Or the sun, the ray of sunlight could do the same. It could suddenly become aware that it is still connected and part of the sun. It can, and you can sense in yourself the undoubted fact that you are conscious. But not only that, we're creating a duality here that doesn't exist when we say that you are conscious. The essence of who you are is consciousness. So you are consciousness. I often say, say yes to the present moment. Or I say, make the present moment your friend, not your enemy. So it's a, to say yes to the present moment is a powerful teaching, but it can be misunderstood and has been misunderstood sometimes. And it needs to be explained what that actually means. It means, <coughs> oh, by the way, um, There's a funny movie made a few, some years ago with Jim Carrey. It's called The Yes Man. And this is a person in the movie, a character, the character he plays. He works at a bank, I think, to, in the mortgage department. And he's very, he's very bitter and he likes to say no to people who apply for mortgages. Every, no, you can't have it, he loves it. And he's very negative about everything. No, his life is uneventful, boring. He's, everything is negative. Then he goes to a new age. Uh, a friend invites him to a, a strange new age event with a new age teacher. And the teacher says, you have to say yes. Yes to everything. Say yes to everything. And uh, he kind of becomes convinced, well, I might as well try that, I've got nothing to lose. And from then on, whatever people ask him, every mortgage he approves, 
And whatever people ask him, can you lend me money? Sure, yes. Can you do this? Yes, yes, yes. And then his life becomes very interesting, but also very chaotic. He, he gets into most chaotic situations and he kind of all uh, gets out of hand. <laughs> and I, uh, in the end, he kind of seems to realize that this wasn't quite working. It, that, that, was, that is not the true meaning. So to say yes to the present moment does not mean that you accept everything that people ask of you. In some cases, you have to use the now, the no, but in the um, non, but not in an angry way that denies the present moment. I call that a high quality no. Uh, so in, let's say, um, in your case, can you look after my children? Or oh, let's begin because I, I need you, you're so, so good with children. She'll flatter you, you feel obliged. You're such a wonderful person. I so love you. Can you do it again, please? And at some point, you have to, I'm sorry, I can't do it anymore. Um, but without any negativity, a simple statement, it is not a reactive statement. You don't make her into, into a bad person. Who, I know she, you want to take advantage of me. I'm not doing it anymore. That is a low quality no. <laughs> uh, even if perhaps you, she did try to, perhaps she was trying to take advantage of you, but that is not, that may be then a dysfunction in her egoic self. Many humans do that. The world is full of people who perhaps are trying to take advantage of you. That's what the egos do. And so or it is not who she truly is. But you speak to, you do not speak to the ego in her. You simply say, I love your children. They're just wonderful and I enjoyed my time, but I can't do it anymore. I'm sorry about that. High quality, no, 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 I can't do that. A person says, can you lend me another thousand uh, um, dollars and you said, well I've already lent you two thousand three months ago and last year I lent you five thousand I haven't got anything back yet and then it's I'm sorry I have to say no but you, you don't say you're just you're just trying to use me and I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to be used anymore by you. This is it. That's it. No more. <laughs> that, that, that's another kind of no, but it's a low quality no. Um, the high quality no seems, no, sorry, that's it. I can't do that anymore. This, it, uh, it, imply, it implies there's a presence behind what you say. It's not reactive. And with the same, the person who asked you to write something, you say, I've seen the backlog, I'm not in agreement with that, therefore I'm sorry, I need, need to say no to this, I can't do this, thank you. High quality, no, it's beautiful, and it works quite often. You may have to use that, make sure that it's not reactive, and then becomes low quality. When I meditate, extreme fear often arises in my mind. I feel like I would be destroyed or completely disappear, so I stop meditation because of the fear. I'm so afraid to keep going on, although I intuitively know that bearing the fear would get me closer to enlightenment. How can I conquer this fear? This is, yes, of course, the fear of the person, the personalized sense of self or the ego, which can feel threatened by the arising awareness. And once you know that, you can still meditate and allow the fear to be there. It's only when you try to run away from the fear that really it becomes a great obstacle. But if you can be with the fear, allow the fear to be there, as on a pure energy level, feel the fear, then you will find it begins to dissolve. So rather than not wanting to feel it, allow yourself to feel it. Then this is the beginning of change. If you always run away from it, then it will linger. There's no change. There's a book called, I think, 
feel the fear and do it anyway or something like that. But that is a quite good advice, although, I mean, not applied necessarily to everything. <laughs> I'm going to jump off now. <laughs> But to allow yourself to feel whatever feeling comes is part of the present, the, what the isness of the present moment. So if the fear arises, but then you also realize what is the, is the fear created by a thought? You will know that. Or is the fear arising just by itself in a particular situation when you become still? Do you have a fear of silence? Do you feel uncomfortable when you go into a room and there's, there's no noise in it? Some people do feel. Some people are uncomfortable in nature. <laughs> it's not noisy enough. <laughs> so, see, it may be that the fear arises when you, when you become still, you meditate. Then it's not necessarily associated with the thought, but with that arising of awareness and instead of stopping your meditation just what happens if I just carry on and make the fear into a meditation meditate on the fear so in, when if you do meditate nothing really can disturb you but the good meditator incorporates whatever arises in the present moment into the meditation including the most irritating noise that suddenly starts up outside. And the mind says, I can't meditate now. I need stillness. And then you realize, no, perhaps this is part of the meditation. And how does it become part of the meditation? By allowing the isness of this moment, which is that by just letting go of resistance, allow whatever it is to be. And if it comes from within, fear, anxiety, you allow that to be. But you have to be careful that it doesn't become a thought because the moment you are drawn back into thinking, that's the end of your meditation. You can allow a thought to be there, but to order to allow a thought to be there that... that uh, implies that there is some awareness there behind the thought, so you are still there. If so, to be able, it's a wonderful thing. Do you allow the thought to be there? It's very different from being drawn into the thought and following it where it wants to take you. Of course, that's the end of your meditation or your mindfulness or whatever you want to call it. I don't use mindfulness, as you know, because it's not about a full mind. That's why I avoid the word mindfulness. But mindfulness is a lovely thing. It's really its presence. So you can follow a thought. It takes, it grabs you. It grabs all your attention and pulls you along. That's one way. Or you can realize there's a thought arising about what my ex-spouse did t five years ago to me <laughs> while I'm meditating. <laughs> and you can allow the thought to arise and to be aware. And if you do that, instead of being pulled into it, then you will find that it quickly, it arises and it subsides. So then it becomes very much like, a, you know, the sky. In the, on, Let's say you have a, a blue sky and clouds occasionally come. So the clouds are the thoughts that arise in the mind. The blue sky, the vastness of that space, is your awareness. So clouds are not a problem if within the larger context of the aware presence. They come and go. And there might be thoughts that say ridiculous things. There might be a thought about, I'd like to eat a... a, a Apple pie now, I really need to eat apple pie. The mic asks you most absurd things to interrupt your meditation. <laughs> uh, then you imagine an apple pie you're eating. 
And then you know there's the thought of apple pie. You allow that to be. You don't get drawn into the apple pie thought or even suddenly you have to get up and run to the fridge to see if there's an apple pie and still in there. So it, the thought arises, you are the sky, that's the awareness, and the thought is what comes into the awareness. Now, if more and more thoughts come, or if you follow one of the cloud thoughts that drift into the space of awareness, one of the cloud thoughts, and you suddenly go, it, it, it grabs hold of you and you follow it, and the cloud gets bigger. <laughs> then it attracts other clouds that correspond to it. They suddenly come from out of nowhere. <laughs> and, and then you are in a big cloud. You're still sitting there trying to meditate, but you're really in a big cloud of thought. And before you know it, the entire sky is cloudy, oh, totally overcast. <laughs> now, of course, there's still some light shining through the clouds, but you no longer know where that comes from. There's some light of, of course, consciousness. Thought cannot exist without consciousness. Thought is a manifestation of consciousness. But so there's the consciousness that is behind the thoughts, but you don't no longer know that consciousness directly, only through the filter of thoughts, in the same way that you don't know the sunlight anymore except through the filter of the clouds. I'm surprised there's nothing on Google about Eckhart and free will, but <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I haven't said anything about it. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> As you know, it's an, it's an eternal ancient philosophical question and there's never been a definitive answer that everybody would agree with in that sense. So is there a real, you mentioned everybody's doing their best because every, nobody can act beyond their level of consciousness, etc. for example. Okay, let's start from on one level, uh, and then we go on to the next level. On the, on the level of uh, uh, egoic, unconsciousness, where you, you are a conditioned entity, your, your mental, emotional makeup is totally conditioned by the past, and you are completely identified with the conditioning of your, of your mind, uh, and in that state, that spiritually speaking is the unconscious state, it is obvious that in that state there is no freedom at all because you are forced to act out the unconscious conditioning of your mind with which you are completely identified. So I think most people would probably agree if you understand that, that on that level uh, there is no possibility of freedom. Your actions are determined by your conditioned mind. You are forced to act as you do because there is no choice because choice would imply some awareness. So on that level there is certainly no freedom. Then awareness comes in. The human being begins to awaken. Then it appears, I am not saying it is the case, it appears that then the human, the free, freedom be, begins to be a possibility because you can choose to step out of the conditioning of your mind. You can recognize a conditioned thought and do, you are no longer compelled to act it out because there is an awareness there. You can choose a certain course of action not, not from the conditioning of your mind but from the uh, presence so you can you can you can act and you have much more freedom that before you could not have freedom comes with awareness so it's then relative to the unconscious day there is now freedom to act but 
if you look more deeply even there, even there on that level, you are connected with the totality of consciousness. You're only an expression of the totality of consciousness. You are not really a separate entity. You are a, like a, as who said it, you, you are, was it Alan Watts who said you are, you, in the same way that the, the wave is something that the ocean is doing, you are something that the whole universe is doing in the same way. So the wave is something the ocean is doing, you are something that the universe is doing. So although it appears from a certain relative to the previous state of unconscious, there is freedom, and relative to that there is freedom. But then if you look more deeply into that, you realize that even there, one cannot say that you are choosing this, you are an expression of consciousness, and consciousness, one could say, is choosing, and you think you are doing it. Sometimes people ask me, can you choose to be present? Uh, and in, from one perspective, you can choose to be present. From another perspective, uh, one could say that presence chooses you. It chooses to become present through you. Depends how you look at it. Uh, so in ultimate terms, or the in relative terms, there is freedom relative to the unconscious state when you become more conscious. But even there, it's only relative to the unconscious state. Even there, there is no, not absolute freedom because you do not exist as an independent entity. You are part of, of the web of interconnectedness that is the whole universe. So in that sense, there is no freedom of choice of the individual because ultimately there is no individual. Have the main focus of your attention in your daily life, in the present moment. The rest of your attention, so that's the, the main focus, here's this. The rest of your attention is where you want to go to. Your, whatever task you're engaged in has a certain purpose. The purpose is you want to finish the task, then it has achieved its purpose, and that's here. And that's in, the, in your peripheral, the peripheral vision of your consciousness. That's where you want to get to. And this is what you're doing in order to get there. And your main attention is not where you want to get, and in the meantime you're just doing it in order to get there. You can see how that already creates an inner stress. I'm here, but I want to be there. That's a normal way of living, is this, the main part of people's attention is there, but in the meantime, they are here, where they don't really want to be. To rather be there, as shown in the famous stickers, on bumper stickers on cars, which say something like, I'd rather be fishing the sense of being an outsider is also something that I have had throughout my life and uh, the sense of not belonging here, uh, watching my parents being engaged in continuous conflict not because they were bad people, they were they did what they did, and they loved me as best they could, and they did what they did as a reflection of their state of consciousness at that time, which was a normal state of consciousness, egoic state of consciousness. But I sometimes felt, uh, how did I get here? Somehow, I didn't. There must have been a mistake. <laughs> um, it's often outsiders uh, on, it's being feeling an outsider. On the one hand, is seems a terrible limitation that you f can't participate as much. On the other hand, it's a great opportunity because 
some of the uh, most creative people uh, in the world have have been outsiders. They did not fit in. Uh, misfits is the English word. Uh, misfits. Um, now, uh, the friendships I had when I was a child, and that's another interesting thing. I had a friend, one of my friends was, had, was severely physically disabled, uh, <coughs> and nobody else wanted to be friends with him because of that, and he was probably my closest friend. And the other one was so weird that nobody wanted to talk to him. <laughs> uh, but he became my friend, so they were outsiders too. And, uh, but the interesting fact here, as you know, I couldn't believe it when they told me that there are people here from 70 countries. It seems almost unbelievable, but it's true, I saw the list. <laughs> 70 countries. And you may find, I'm sure you will find, quite often, uh, you, you, you can feel a bond or you have, you have more in common with many of the people who are here than you have with your own people in your own country at home who are not going through any spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. who are still totally conditioned, 100% conditioned by their culture. So you feel a connectedness here with other humans that transcends culture and conditioning and all this silly political stuff. It transcends that. And this is a, a wonderful thing. So to some extent, uh, you can now connect with people even if you don't always see them physically you might live i don't know whether you live in a big city or a small village a uh, small city small city small city yeah yeah <laughs> what city uh, innsbruck in austria oh yes yeah nice very nice uh, i don't know how many people in innsbruck are 120000 and how many of those are awakening we don't know <laughs> <laughs> we don't know, of course. But this helps, I believe, being here and feeling you are not alone. Mm. You are connected. So this should be a help for, for the rest. You just have to accept that this is how it is. Mm. And no matter how hard you try to fit in on the normal level, you probably won't, nor do you have to. Mm -hmm. So I know this, there are many people here who feel that and be happy with it. Yeah. But don't make it into some kind of superiority because the ego can always creep in. Mm. Before you know it, there's always a back door and then the ego is back in. So you, can, you could go from feeling bad about being an outsider to suddenly feeling, okay, I'm an outsider because I'm superior. <laughs> and then, so d d we have to be careful and don't go there. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just how it is. If you you probably would not be here if you had not been an out felt like an outsider for many years. Yeah. So it, it worked. You won't really enjoy the fruit of your labors if habitually you cannot be present in the moment. No matter what you achieve, the enjoyment will be short-lived because of the habitual pattern of dissatisfaction. In the background, it's always there, some obscure sense of lack, and often it comes into the foreground as real unhappiness, frustration. And then if you realize that there's always this waiting for the next thing, which is thought, when you're waiting for the next thing, you're trapped in thought because that's where the future happens. Now, the realization that this is happening to you is very important. The first step is uh, the beginning of something else arising. 
And in all of you that has already arisen, or that occasionally it still gets obscured, perhaps, probably, I assume, something else has arisen that's not thought, that is beyond thought, the ability to recognize thought, the ability to recognize certain patterns that habitually arise in your mind, your mental, emotional field, the ability to witness that which arises in your mental, emotional field, that's an enormous leap in consciousness. Another dimension, one could say, has arisen. We could call it presence. We could call it awareness. It's not thought, but it's intelligence. So intelligence is not confined to thought. There is a dimension in you that is far greater, far more intelligent than any intelligent thought. It's the place from where all intelligence arises, a place of where all creativity arises. So there's the ability to suddenly be aware of your inner states, to be aware of what's, what your mind is saying, the, the narrative, the habitual narrative, that you're telling yourself, you're having a monologue, or many people have a dialogue with themselves, where they split themselves in two, and then this one argues with the other, why aren't you good enough? Why did you do this? Why do you never get anything right? This shouldn't have, he shouldn't have said that, yes, but on the other hand, so you can have a, dialogue in your narrative, or you can have a monologue, says, I am such a miserable creature. Because a lot of the time, the narratives, the unconscious thought processes tend to be more negative than positive for many, many people. <clears throat> So to be aware that this is happening, that's an enormous gain in consciousness. It's the beginning of awakening, spiritually speaking. Something arises that is not part of the conditioned mind patterns. So there's the ability to observe your inner states. And that's a wonderful little pointer to ask yourself uh, frequently, what's my inner state at this moment? And then look at it direct your attention to it, the narratives, what have I been telling myself, and the emotion that accompanies the narrative. What am I feeling? What's the emotion? So in addition to being a story in your head and an emotion, there's a knowing behind it. There's a space behind it. Sometimes I call it inner space. There's an inner space from where you can be aware of what's happening on the level of the person, the personality. Because that inner space, the awareness, is not part of the personality, it's but it's the being, the knowing that is inherent in the being. You can look at the world wars, you can look at all the, the terrorism and all the other mad wars that are being fought as just, it's just a question of degrees of unconsciousness, not different. So when you go into that state of unconsciousness, you, it takes you over, you lose it, Basically, then, that is the same energy field that has created what we see as the mad madness of human history and what we see of the madness of the so-called world news. <laughs> the same energy. So don't complain about all these violent people who are doing all these dreadful things. All that it is, is human our unconsciousness in a more pronounced form than yours or your partner's. And so that helps a little bit to find 
perhaps almost some compassion towards all these crazy people that are doing such crazy things and creating such terrible suffering. Now, if you become compassionate towards them, don't worry. It doesn't mean that they will not experience the consequences of their unconsciousness. That still happens. You, so by being compassionate to another human being, you don't necessarily remove the karmic consequences of their action. But you yourself become free from, the, from being drawn into the karmic cycle. So the, the act of forgiveness does not mean that this person is not going to suffer the consequences, because life makes sure in whatever form that they do suffer the consequences of the suffering that they inflict on other human beings. It's a karmic law. But if you don't want to be part of that anymore, if you want to step out of the karmic law, the, the first step out of the, and the most important step out of the karmic law is forgiveness. <laughs> then you do not feed it, you don't become part of it. That's why traditionally in spiritual teachings of various traditions, forgiveness is always emphasized. It must be real though. It's, there are many forms of superficial forgiveness when just the mind says, okay, I forgive you. It's not deep, it's not real yet. The mind is trying to forgive. But you, you can only forgive if you realize that whatever actions have been perpetrated are the effects of human unconsciousness. In other words, what Jesus said on the cross or is reported to have said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Very profound statement. It is a profound statement that can be applied to any act of uh, violence perpetrated against other humans or life forms. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Not knowing what they do, of course, means they are unconscious. The word unconscious probably in that sense wasn't used at the time. So he said they don't know what they do. Karmic law still operates, but without you. <laughs> and you can notice karmic law when, when you see a movie. Some movies like to manipulate your emotions. And so there are particular types of movies where they first they build up the tension by showing you some very evil person. And this evil person is killing all these people or hurting all these people. And then you're being manipulated to feel that incredible pull that this person should suffer for what he or she has done. That's the manipulation. And the audience loves that. They love watching things like that. So then the emotion builds up. And finally, there are even some movies like the, the movies that uh, about um, vigilantes who take justice in their own hands because the justice system doesn't deal with the criminals anymore. So finally you have this guy who goes out and kills all the bad guys. And the, your emotions have been manipulated so much that the audience says, yes, yes, he must die. Not realize <laughs> now what you what you are feel what what you are feeling. This incredible. It might also happen if you read about some dreadful crime that somebody has committed, and then if you read it on the internet, the you can read in some on some news websites. You can read the comment section, <laughs> and in the comment section, on every other comment says. We should have the death penalty, he needs to say electric chair, he needs to be done to what he did, did he, they should do to him, and all these. And this is an enormous pressure that people feel inside, and this is connected to karmic law. 
<laughs> because there's a compens compensatory factor in karmic law and you can feel that as the pressure inside you, but it keeps you trapped in karma. <laughs> so in that sense, watching these movies is not helpful <laughs> because it keeps you trapped in that, that wheel of, the, of karma. So they don't teach forgiveness there. <laughs> so this is, we are talking it's about something very important and that is dealing with human unconsciousness and what looks like evil. So there are many things that are quite dreadful. So how do we, how does that affect our state of consciousness and what role does our state of consciousness play in this whole scenario? It does have a role to play. So it's for us important that we are no longer part of action and reaction because the definition of karma is action. Karma means action and reaction. And it goes on and on. And as you can see in certain societies and so on, the karmic thing goes on, goes back centuries and centuries. The same grievance <laughs> transmitted from one generation to the next and the next and the next, and they are all asleep. This is why spiritual teachings say you are asleep. They are all so unconscious they get taken over by the collective mental emotional pattern and the mental story. They just inherit it from their parents and then they pass it on to their children. And then they, and each generation suffers. They suffer. They call much suffering for each other. And at some point, the suffering becomes almost unbearable for certain people within that society. And that's the beginning of a shift when it gets too much. So suffering drives humans to a point of awakening. That's a strange paradox here is the suffering is created by the unconsciousness in humans, but in some strange way, Eventually, it wakes you up, it awakens you. That's the redeeming feature behind the suffering that humans create for each other. Eventually, it leads to a spiritual awakening. So, it all, the good thing to realize, it all comes down to your state of consciousness and how you relate to the people around you, and that spreads, that is what creates the world. And even how you react to when you listen to the world news has a certain influence because all, all human minds are connected at a deeper level. So the way in which you react to what you hear on the world news contributes either to the unconsciousness. If you get on, the, on your computer or the iPad and you type in, this guy does not deserve to live. <laughs> he, he, he should be, die slowly and they should torture <laughs> him. <laughs> then you become part of the same karma. <laughs> if you've ever done that, please forgive yourself. <laughs> And if you enjoy reading those comments, also forgive yourself. Certain actions take place. You do things you know they're not the optimal things to do, but you can't help it. It's something acts through you. Um, there's a, there seems to be some power there that makes you do things that you know, know are not right or not good for you and yet you can't stop it. That seems to be the case. Um, and that, of course, um, 
is often the case with people who are with you it might be many different different areas of your life but uh, um, this is also the case with addictions for example people who are addicted to a certain substance or who are addicted to eating too much or drinking um, there's something that overpowers them in you that seems to obscure the awareness or the awareness is pushed to, to the side and this thing, this, this powerful thing, does it anyway. <laughs> and again, my answer is a little bit similar to um, what I said to the first questioner uh, tonight. Uh, the, the power of presence needs to grow in you so that it is strong enough not to, it's not willpower, because willpower is not the best way of dealing with these things, but it's what I'm talking about could sometimes be confused with willpower, but willpower includes the um, application of a force to hold something down. Let's say, um, if your addiction is to um, have a, to indulge in uh, intoxicating beverages, in other words, booze is the British word, <laughs> uh, then, uh, and you can feel it, it's, it comes on, there it comes, you know the bottles are there, there they are, and you feel you have to go there, and you have to reach out, and you have to pour yourself a drink. Now, when you're not aware at all, you don't even know what you're doing, you're so unconscious that you, you're already holding the drink and you're drinking, then you, at that point you, you even know that you're drinking. Uh, the same with food, I've spoken to people who have had addictions to food, they often say they wake up when they're already, they've already eaten in the middle of the night, they've already unconsciously gone to the fridge, taken out the chocolate cake, and then they're already halfway through the chocolate cake and suddenly they're like, what am I doing? <laughs> but, so awareness comes in at a very late point. Willpower would be to hold a, an urge down that say, I've got, they have to pull, or even what the example you gave, you want to turn on the TV and you know it's not right because I, I'm not here for that and he actually told us not to do it. <laughs> And I, but I can't help it. I have to go. I can't. I can't. Uh, no willpower. You would. You would say, I'm going to hold this down. I'm not going to do it. And I can, you can feel the urge, but you're holding it down. Um, when you hold things down, often after a while. The, an explosion happens. It's like a boiling kettle. Can't hold it for that long. And, and then you have some kind of rationalization in your mind. Why, why it's, you'll do it anyway. The mind will give you a reason. First, you see the need the, to be a victim. Identity also, unfortunately, is a form of ego. Because any conceptual identity is a form of ego. And even though you seem to be amply justified in uh, having a victim identity because of the things that other humans did to you, you yourself are finding, you are finding yourself in a kind of prison that uh, cre created by your mind. So there's no denial of that bad things happen to you, yes. <clears throat> now question is, how do you exit this mental prison? The first step is perhaps to see <clears throat> um, that uh, unconscious human beings, unconscious human beings in the grip of their own conditioning, their own ego, uh, they have virtually no free will. When you are unconscious, you are controlled by the, the mind patterns that 
are lodged in your psyche, you, have, you cannot really speak of free will by somebody who has zero awareness. And yet their entire makeup is uh, conditioning from the past. So the famous sentence phrase used by Jesus in connection with forgiveness on the cross, he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, these, these two interesting, these points put together, forgive them. Why forgive them? They know not what they do. In other words, if he had spoken these days, using our terminology, he probably would have said, they are completely unconscious. <laughs> because that's what it means, they know not what they do. They are completely unconscious. Uh, so when you see, uh, nobody can act beyond their level of consciousness, then you see that it's almost like, it becomes almost like the evil that was perpetrated, it becomes almost like a natural phenomenon that is like you've been hit by lightning or something, or <laughs> lived in very unpleasant climatic conditions <laughs> that, that injured you, <laughs> near a volcano. <laughs> My dad what had problems with anger, huge outbursts of anger quite frequently. It was living like living next to a volcano that could erupt at any moment. <laughs> um, and he could not help it. It was, it was impossible. There was no possibility of being different. And so these humans are run by unconscious conditioning usually goes back to their childhood and what happened there. I know why my father was angry. I, I, I realized much later that it all originated in his childhood, the, the reasons why he was so angry. And also, for a while, also I felt a resentment towards that. And only when I was able to awaken out of egoic consciousness, I saw that there, there's nothing that he could have done differently because there wasn't enough awareness. Now, when you see that, then you don't personalize or you don't create an identity for other humans out of their unconsciousness because in essence, that's not who they are. The recognition that, this first recognition then, step one, you recognize that no human can act beyond their conditioning in the absence of awareness. If there's awareness, they can transcend their conditioning. And then they begin to become conscious of their own conditioned mental emotional, dysfunctional mental emotional patterns. Yes. So they couldn't, they can't help it. So that's, that's already a useful step in forgiveness, but it, it, you may not yet be able to arrive at, at full forgiveness because of that. Another, before I continue with that, does that mean then, a question may arise in your mind, does that mean then humans are not really responsible for what they do? If they are unconscious, how are they responsible? And does that mean then that we shouldn't punish them for what they do? If they commit a crime, are they not guilty? That's an interesting question. The, the unconsciousness that operates in human, even if you are able to forgive a human, and we'll come, we'll go more fully into that in a minute, even if you're able to forgive a human for their transgressions or whatever they did, uh, this does not mean, and even though the human is not responsible for their unconsciousness, and yet it is built into the structure of human life, they still need to suffer the consequences of their unconsciousness. Is religion necessary? It depends who you are on the level of the form, 
For some people, it can be necessary or helpful for two reasons. It can provide the more superficial reason. It can give your life a certain amount of structure, which for some people can be helpful. Regular practice. Gives you a feeling of comfort. Uh, some people have too little structure in their lives and others have too much already. If you have too little structure in your life, then religion can provide that. More importantly, on another level, religion can either obscure the spiritual dimension within yourself, and often it does, or if used rightly, if approached rightly, if understood on a deeper level, it can help you access and stay in connectedness with that deeper level of yourself or the transcendent dimension of consciousness. Whether or not you need it, only you can know whether you find it either helpful or a hindrance. It can be either, depend, depends on you as a person, your past, what function it had in your past, and so on. It is a hindrance if religion becomes an ideology, then it operates only on the level of the mind and is very similar to any other kind of ideology that you may believe in, whether it's uh, communism as, a, as an ideology or any political theory or anything that explains the universe. It could be a metaphysical system that you completely believe in, philosophical system, and so on. So an ideology is something that takes possession of your mind and exerts a controlling function uh, and it can influence almost your entire mental functioning if it becomes something of uh, overwhelming power in your mind. It's a, it's a little thought that grows into a huge thing in your mind and the tentacles reach into every aspect of your mind and there are religious people like that. Uh, usually you can recognize that it is an ideology by the fact that they are not peaceful human beings <laughs> and by the fact that they have enemies either even within their own religion or another religion. Anybody who does not agree with their ideology becomes an enemy. In the same way, the people who were not nowadays that many were deeply believing in c communism, which was a wonderful idea to start with, of course. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. It was a beautiful idea of equality. Everybody the same, that is wonderful. No personal possessions, oh, it's wonderful too. And the only mistake was it was imposed from outside by people who themselves has not gone beyond the egoic state of consciousness. They just played it in their mind as, that's a good idea. And then it was imposed on, on other people who also were not in that state of consciousness. But most importantly, those who imposed the idea on others forced them to live it out the ideal became contaminated with ego. So when these people came to power, their egos became inflated to an enormous degree, almost to absurdity, and without realizing it, 
they uh, reenacted the same evils, and in some cases worse than those that they were fighting against. I don't remember who said it, but Zen master said it. Don't seek for the truth. Just cease or stop cherishing opinions. That is, I believe, points to the same inner state of disidentification from thinking. She doesn't cling to ideas. Cling to. It doesn't mean she doesn't have ideas, the master. But the master does not cling to ideas. And the Zen master, when he said, don't look for the truth, just stop cherishing opinions. He didn't say, stop having opinions. Just as Lao Tse does not say, don't have ideas. He says, don't cling to ideas. And the other master says, stop cherishing opinions. So this clinging, which is the same as cherishing, is self-identification with thoughts that arise. In other words, you then believe completely in every thought that comes into your head. <laughs> Amazing. You believe in it, that means you are it. You, that is self-identification with thinking. So, <laughs> how then to be at one, always at one with the Tao? So simple. On the one hand, you could call it Stop cherishing opinions. Now, any thought that arises ultimately is an opinion, you could say. Stop cherishing, stop your self-identification with that. Or don't cling to ideas, in the words of Lao Tse, or the, this present translation here. So that there's always a space between you and your thoughts, that you are, or rather, you are not the thought, you are the space for the thought. This is how I put it sometimes. You're familiar with that. And perhaps you, in yourself you know it. You don't have to be in your thoughts, but you can be the space for your thoughts. Then no matter how weird your thoughts are, it doesn't matter that much. You don't say, oh my God, I shouldn't be having these weird thoughts. No, because that's another thought. <laughs> I'm spiritually, I'm supposed to be spiritually advanced and why am I still having these thoughts? There must be something wrong with me. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> that's also thoughts. That's more thoughts that say, I shouldn't be having these thoughts, there's something wrong with me. Oh, and then you believe in those thoughts. <laughs> thoughts that judge other thoughts. That may sound familiar to some of you. And there's nothing personal in it, it's the human mind. <laughs> so you don't need to eliminate thoughts or to say, I should only have pure thoughts because I'm a spiritual person. Because by now I should have transcended all impure thoughts. Well, then you're in a dilemma because in this world of polarities, if you only want to have pure thoughts, you're creating the other polarity. 
in the unseen. And sooner or later, the other polarity will come up from behind, creep up. And this has been done sometimes by Christians who try to practice the teachings of Christ without entering the state of consciousness out of which that comes. So they try to be pure and spiritual and good Christians and denied the other polarity, repressed it, and then suddenly they get overpowered by something deeply destructive and negative. So you have these occasion. you have a nice, wonderful person who always talks in spiritual, just so and spiritual. And before you know it, he's screaming at his wife or even hitting his wife. Where did that come from? And he can't even admit to himself that, that this is what's happening. And so if you push away certain thoughts that you, because they do not fit into your, the mental image of who you are as this or that, then they get a, become, assume a life of their own. And before you know it, they invade your mind again. If only in your dreams and suddenly you have dreadful nightmares where during, during the day you're such a spiritual person and at night you suddenly have dreadful nightmares. Monsters come or you become a monster. Oh my God, this shouldn't be happening. And that's because you're pushing something away. The true spiritual does not lie in one thought or another thought. It lies in being there as the space for your thoughts. Then it doesn't matter anymore, really. Any, whatever thought arises is no more than that. It's a form that arises at this moment. You don't resist it. You don't need to resist it. But you are the space for it. You don't become it. Somebody sent me a sticker to put on the car. I haven't put it on my car yet. A very wise sticker. I don't know where it originated. It says, you don't need to believe every thought you think. <laughs> so this is the practice then of being the space or the witness for your thoughts rather than being the thought. And you can practice with your opinions. Many thoughts are actual, most thoughts can, all thoughts could be called opinions, but there are certain things that are definitely, clearly recognizable as opinions when you are talking to people every day when you're having a discussion or talk with friends or colleagues or neighbors. So they will express their opinion, whatever it may be about, and you may express your opinion. And you can then observe whether or not there is self-identification with your opinion. And your opinion, of course, is a mental position. A, the position of the mind. Are you identified with a mental position? If you are, then you are cherishing opinions, in the words of the Zen master, or you are clinging to ideas in the words of Lao Tse. And how do you know that? You know that when, as you discuss things, you become either defensive or aggressive in the expression of your opinion. Emotion flows into, and you get worked up in, uh, uh, why is that happening? Why are you becoming defensive or aggressive and of course you have to look inside yourself to see whether this is the case or not. Are you becoming defensive or aggressive? You feel the influx of emotion. And why is this happening? Because unconsciously you feel threatened by somebody who attacks or questions or contradicts your mental position. Why do you feel threatened by somebody who questions your mental position? That is a sign that you had identified with the mental position. And identified means your sense of self was in it. So the person is not attacking your opinion in your unconscious viewpoint. The person, you're being attacked in your, 
your very life is being a, under, is under attack <laughs> because you identified this. This is not true, but this is how it is perceived as if they were attacking your very existence because you identified with the mental position. There was a self in it. So anybody who questions it questions your very existence. It's an unconscious process. <laughs> so that's an amazing thing to realize in yourself, and it's a deep-seated unconscious pattern in most human beings. And of course, as you become conscious of that, you can usually see it much more clearly in others, more easily, in your friend or whoever you're having, than in yourself. Usually says, oh, yes, that's what he always does. <laughs> of course, now I understand what my husband or my wife does. I understand completely. That's step one. Then alertness is required to truly perceive things, and immediately things become more alive, and less problematic when you're going to sense perception because the problematic dimension is in the head and you're going to sense perception suddenly you come into the present moment and in the present moment problems disappear isn't that strange so the mind says well I still have them well, yeah when you start thinking about them you have them again but when you're not thinking about them you have no problems. Now, some of you will argue with that, but let me explain. You have situations in your life that can be challenging, and you have to deal with these situations, but the only place where you can deal with the challenging situations is in the present moment. And dealing with a challenging situation in the present moment is not a problem. You're dealing with a challenging situation. You're facing it, you're looking at it, and that looking is important. What I call looking really is paying, putting your attention on it, which is the power of consciousness. And while you're looking, you're not thinking. Every person who has achieved mastery in any field knows what I mean by looking because there's an, that absolute presence. And then that person does what he or she does. It's, it, flow, it flows from that presence. So you look, there's no problem. Problem is when you dwell mentally on something that will happen, could happen, might happen. It's a problem that's something I have to face next week, but not now. And you're totally absorbed in that, that's a problem. Uh, an interesting thing, I may have even written that in the Power of Now, if you think you have problems, ask yourself, what problem do I have at this moment? But this moment really means this moment. And then you have to go, hmm, well, I've got all my, my wife, my ex-wife is suing me. I'm about to lose my home. Uh, person close to me is ill. I might lose my job. I have to look for a new job. Okay, what problem do you have at this moment? You're breathing, feeling the aliveness in the body, looking around. Well, well, at this moment, I don't actually have a problem. You have to then admit, if you really go into the present moment, it, the, mo the problem cannot survive in the present moment. <laughs> That's an amazing realization. Doesn't mean that you no longer deal with what you need to deal with. You deal with it when the moment comes more effectively, when you don't waste your life energy in the mental realm of creating problems that you cannot be dealt with at this moment. And if you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about your problems and what you can do about them, it's extremely unlikely that you find any solution by worrying at four o'clock in the morning about it. But if you became still at four o'clock in the morning and wake up and go into the inner energy field of the body rather than thinking about your problems, in other words, leave the dimension of problems, come deeply into the present moment, then perhaps the next morning when you wake up, you suddenly say, oh, I know what I have to do now. I know how I can deal with it now. And the right course of action happens because you've gone there but not through the problem-making faculty in the human mind. 
So again, coming back to your question, when things are, when you're not yet not being challenged, practice it. And then when you are being challenged by little things that goes wrong, so to speak, in daily life tends to happen, you might have noticed. Things don't always go according to your expectations. Sometimes you miss the bus or something, you miss the plane or something else goes wrong. It tends to happen actually quite a lot. It seems to be part of life. That's, by the way, it's the reason why people go to see movies. Because the substructure of every movie that you see, we could call it, it applies to virtually every movie you see. If you can examine any movie you see, what actually happens in the movie? In fact, I can describe every movie to you in three words. Something goes wrong. <laughs> Because there wouldn't be a movie otherwise. Nothing would happen. N nobody would evolve. There would, everything would be dead. But in your own life, you complain. So you go, you see movies to see something go wrong, but when it happens in your own life, you complain. And not you personally, you've transcended it perhaps already. <laughs> but, but so the strange thing is, it's, things are not meant not to go wrong. Going wrong is part of the totality of how life experiences itself. If things didn't go wrong, it would be very uninteresting and nobody would evolve because people only evolve through the challenges that they encounter. And in a good movie, the protagonist or the character changes as he or she faces the pro that which goes wrong in the movie. In a bad movie, so to speak, the character does not go through any changes. The, that which goes wrong is only solved on an external level. The, in the end, the bad guy is killed, and that's the end of the movie, but nothing else happens. <laughs> so something going wrong is part of how life experiences itself. And again, you can then bring awareness to that so that you don't always fall into reactivity when something goes wrong, but you immediately align with it. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For some incredible Joe Dispenza motivation, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. When you begin to create from the field instead of from matter, the only way you can do that is you have to learn how to take all of your attention off your body and become a nobody. Take all of your attention off all the people in your life that you give so much of your attention